Greetings. I'm Metin Akai, the president-elect of IEEE Engineering Medicine and Biology Society and the founding chair of Biomedical Engineering Department at University of Houston, Texas. During this difficult time, there has been urgent need for biomedical engineers, clinicians, and healthcare leaders to work together to develop novel, novel diagnostic tools and therapeutics to find the pandemics. To address the challenges of bringing these novel innovations into the clinical settings quickly, we have organized a four-day global meetings with the participation of 29 experts to discuss the challenges and opportunities in COVID-19 healthcare, screening, diagnostic, and therapeutics. We strongly believe that this, this form will help us to build a unique a platform to strengthen our uh, the, uh, the collective capability to exchange ideas as well as share models, data, and also latest reports on the fight against the pandemic. We will start today with the first symposium on healthcare, and tomorrow we will have the COVID-19 screening and the Saturday tracking. And finally, on Sunday, we will have the last symposium on treatment. It's a great honor and pleasure for me to introduce our first plenary speaker, Dr. Bikem Boskurt. Dr. Boskurt is a specialist, advanced heart failure and cardiac transplant specialist at the Baylor College of Medicine. She is also the Associate Provost of Faculty Affairs and Senior Associate Dean of Faculty Development. She is endowed professor, Mary Ann Gordon Kane Chair in Cardiology and Professor of Medicine. She is also the Vice Chair of the Department of Medicine and Medical Care Line Executive at the Dobecki BA Medical Center in Houston, Texas. Dr. Boskurt is the immediate past president of Heart Failure Society of America. She has published more than 200 peer reviewed papers. She has been identified as one of Web of Science world's highly cited researchers in 2019. She has been serving on advisory editorial board of several the highly respected the, the journals and the, especially the related cardiovascular and heart, heart failure. In her career, Dr. Boskurt has been recognized for excellence in clinical care, education, and leadership. And she has been the recipient of the National Veterans Affairs Secretary Hands and Heart Award for recognition of highest standards in patient care. Recently, she has been also selected among the top 100 Turks leading medicine and the second highest ranking Turkish woman scientist by Turkish Time magazine. Dr. Boskurt actively participates in clinical and translational research, pres presents at the national international meeting, teaches medical students, residents, fellows at the bedside in the classroom settings, mentors, trainees, faculty, locally and nationally. Dr. Bosco, it's a great honor and pleasure to have you. Dr. It's podium is yours. Thank you. Uh, these are my disclosures. Well, these are my disclosures. And I will first start with the pre-COVID era as to what we know about the infection of the heart. And in the pre-COVID era, the common infectious etiologies for myocarditis included a variety of pathogens, including viruses such as adenovirus, Coxsackie, and enteroviruses, uh, or HIV. Coronaviruses cause cold, but not were uh, the typical cause of myocarditis in the pre-COVID era. And the pathogenesis of viral myocarditis in the pre-COVID era was characterized in three phases. The acute phase of viral entry and activation of the innate immune response, usually within a week. A second phase of activation of acquired immune response, usually accompanied with cytokine and chemokine release. 
And finally, the recovery phase, which could be with disease progression while the virus is being cleared, but accompanied sometimes with maladaptive fibrosis, remodeling, and uh, cardiomyopathy in some of the patients. The natural history of viral myocarditis in the pre-COVID era was quite unpredictable. In children with acute myocarditis, there were reports up to 40% of children developing chronic heart failure and or requiring cardiac transplantation at 10 years. So it was quite uh, of a burden in the younger population. 12% of sudden cardiac death in young adults had been reported to be attributable to viral myocarditis in the past, in the pre-COVID era. Mortality rates in biopsy-verified viral myocarditis was reported to cause uh, mortality up to 20 to 40 percent at, at about four years. And of course, those with EKG abnormalities, widening of the EKG, or advanced heart failure symptoms, or lower ejection fraction or pumping function of the heart had worse outcomes. Among patients with bad cardiac function, half of them recovered, quarter had persistent cardiac dysfunction, and a quarter required transplantation and or died. This is in the pre-COVID era. There was also evidence of electrical instability of the heart with viral myocarditis. Among patients with active or prior myocarditis, the lethal, the lower chamber, which we call as ventricular tachyarrhythmia, was reported in somewhere around seven to all the way up to about 47% in some series. And those who recovered actually were left with sequelae of heart failure, requiring heart failure hospitalizations in the order of about six to eight percent of the population who had the viral myocarditis. The syndrome of viral myocarditis presentation varied all the way from a heart attack-like presentation to heart failure and all the way to shock. This is in the pre-COVID era. And the diagnosis usually entailed the clinical presentation, the electrocardiography features and biomarker features that created an enhanced risk profile and suspicion for myocarditis, and in some individuals, when we did biopsy, we would then look at the immunohistochemistry and histological features. And if we saw a lot of lymphocytes, because that was the future, the patognomonic future of myocarditis, then we called it lymphocytic, likely viral myocarditis. The other entity that was evolving rapidly is diagnostic modalities, especially with cardiac magnetic resonance imaging. And the features that we would look for for myocarditis is edema of the wall, suggesting inflammation, and features such as differential um, hyperemia or blood perfusion of the walls, <clears throat> as well as scarring of the heart or fibrosis with late gadolinium enhancement. And we came up with certain criteria to be able to diagnose myocarditis. And these features <clears throat> were considered as major or minor criteria that supported a diagnosis of myocarditis. And if we look at the coronaviruses that cause infections of the heart or cardiac um, involvement, historically, as I mentioned before, coronaviruses have not been commonly associated with myocardial damage, those that cause the, the common cold. But SARS-CoV-1, which infected more than 8,000 individuals, did not have fulminant myocarditis as a common feature, except for very rare cases. In one autopsy series, SARS-CoV-1 was amplifiable by PCR in about 35% of the heart. So it was in the heart. But when we looked at the cross cuts, there was no lymphocytic myocarditis. So the myocytes didn't look like they were the ones infected. MERS-CoV uh, infection infected more than 2,000 individuals, and there was only one case report of uh, MRI diagnosis or, or suspicion of myocarditis. <clears throat> In the COVID-19 era, the spectrum of cardiac or cardiovascular manifestations was variable. It ranged from 
features suggesting, um, suggestive of myocarditis to heart attack, to heart failure, to clots, clots inside the heart or uh, originating from the heart or in the vessels, and a lot of inflammation in the vessel walls throughout the whole continuum of the, the vascular circuit, both in the arteries and as well as in the veins. And thus, the presentations could be with chest pain or shortness of breath, as you can imagine, which overlaps with the COVID infection symptoms, arrhythmia, sudden death, shock. And shock could be due to the infection and the lung infection itself, but also to, um, due to the cardiac failure itself. And this whole spectrum of a gradient of variety of cardiac presentations created major subdivisions in cardiology to have to create their pathways of how to treat heart attack, heart failure, or shock of accompanied with COVID-19. The underlying pathophysiology um, probably is multifactorial. There appears to be overall an injury pattern in the cardiac myocyte. We are able to detect that by biomarkers, and I'll touch on that in a minute. There are features of pro-inflammatory mediators such as cytokines. There's cytokine storm-like picture. There is evidence of, of course, dilation in the vessels due to the infection, which probably is creating hypotension and thus reduced perfusion in the heart and a supply-demand mismatch. There's, of course, hypoxia, which is stressing the heart. But very interestingly, very, very interestingly, along with this cytokine surge, there is evidence of through the whole continuum of the vasculature, microvascular and thrombotic injury. It looks like the vessels are getting inflamed and injured. And if we look at the pattern of myocardial injury in the hospitalized patients, and this, these data are from the early reports from Wuhan, China, Approximately one-third of the hospitalized patients had evidence of myocardial injury by myomarkers, such as cardiac troponin. And these were especially higher, as you can see on the upper panel, the, among those individuals with pre-existing cardiac conditions. And this was also associated with increased mortality. And if we look at the markers of injury presented on the left side, and markers of increased filling pressures, the stretch of the heart presented on the right side. As you can see, those who died or demonstrated hemodynamic instability had, had much higher levels of markers of injury and stretch in the hospitalized patient. And when did these rise? Could we use these to predict? It's very interesting if you were to um, look at the clinical course that is represented on this slide, the cardiac involvement appears to happen about a week later than the initial admission. So the initial admission within the first week is usually with presentation of pulmonary or systemic features. And when the patient is crashing, requiring intubation or mechanical ventilation along with hypoxia, and as the blood pressure is dropping, the heart also starts to struggle. So the cardiac injury is a hemodynamically unstable feature usually accompanying ICU stay. And as a feature, it's very interesting. If you were to focus on the left lower panel and in the red line, that is the, the cardiac troponin or the marker of injury, those individuals who had a, a sicker profile but demonstrated further rise throughout the hospitalization. So yes, they had a little bit more elevated on, that, on the presentation, but consistent rise, consistent rise along with other biomarkers represented on this slide of inflammation, such as the interleukin-6 or D-dimer, which is a marker of clotting, and or uh, markers of injury persistently going up, represent a feature of cardiac involvement. And this created the paradigm of, shall we use these biomarkers to do risk assessment at the time of presentation? And if they're rising, then preemptively, uh, utilize other diagnostic and treatment modalities, but this is highly debated at this point because a variety of our patients are sent home. Not everybody is able to be admitted. And the cardiac injury prevalence is approximately 7 to 20% of the whole uh, COVID population. 
even about 10% or 12% of those without baseline cardiovascular disease. So one out of 10 patients may have this biomarker of cardiac injury in their blood profile when and if checked. And this, of course, uh, prevalence is much higher amongst those who did not survive. 50% of the patients who die with COVID will have an abnormal cardiac troponin I level. And, and I'll compare to other infections, other viral myocarditis, the cardiac troponin I elevation was seen usually in about 1% of the patients. And uh, again, just to demonstrate the prevalence in the midline of what percentage of hospitalized patients are demonstrating cardiac involvement um, across all studies, including the US, is somewhere between you know, 15 to 20 percent of all hospitalized patients. Other than the biomarkers, we have evidence of cardiac dysfunction. This is an echo study done in a prospective manner in all comers to a hospital in Israel, approximately 100 consecutive COVID patients. Very humbling findings. 70 percent, these are all comers, all comers, not just ICU patients, to the hospital when imaged within 24 hours of admission, 70% had abnormal heart. Majority of the findings in this study was the right ventricle, but um, significant portion um, showed already 10% uh, contractile dysfunction on the left side too. Uh, there was a very interesting study done by Servimonkey across the continents um, um, involving about 1,200 patients from 69 countries where um, the providers were asked to enter the, uh, to a survey monkey uh, questionnaire saying, when are you doing the study? Where are you doing the study? Whether the patient's in the ICU or in the acute care outpatient setting and write down what you find. And in that survey monkey, 45% of the patients were normal. 55% of all the COVID screening appear to have an abnormal echocardiogram, and about 40% uh, revealed that the left ventricle was abnormal, and uh, 39%, uh, in about 33%, the right ventricle was abnormal. And amongst 900 without baseline heart disease, again, about 46% had abnormal echo. And this, of course, raised the concern also about the temporal trends of what was happening with cardiac arrest along the time of COVID. Um, and these were showing very adverse trends. In Italy, there was a 58% increase in out of car uh, hospital cardiac arrest in COVID-19. And about 78% of these were attributable to COVID-19. Similarly in Paris, compared with previous years, there was a surge in out, in the up, um, out of hospital cardiac arrest during the COVID surge with a rapid return back to normal after the surge. And these may be related to reduced access to care in the emergency system and dying from underlying cardiovascular disease, but certainly raises the questions for increased cardiac arrest with COVID. In terms of long-term effects of COVID, there was a very recent study that created a lot of controversy and concern. This is a study conducted uh, among 100 patients who recovered from COVID. 67% uh, of these had the COVID infection at home, never required hospitalization. About one third were hospitalized and discharged. And these studies were conducted about three months later with cardiac MRI. When MRI was done in the recovery phase, 78% of the MRIs were termed as abnormal, mainly by that edema finding in the wall and sometimes also with the systolic or contractile dysfunction and even evidence of scarring. This was accompanied with 71% also having a biomarker abnormality in the blood. So 78% had abnormal MRI after recovery from COVID with 71% about the same having biomarker abnormality. And this was followed by a college athlete study um, um, uh, which uh, uh, studied again um, the athletes, young athletes who recovered from COVID and it showed 15% of the college athletes from Ohio State had abnormal cardiac MR findings with abnormal P2 images and uh, late gadolinium enhancement. Uh, just looking at one feature alone, they were able to demonstrate that 46% had that. Um, the biomarkers were not elevated in this group, in this young group, and two of the four uh, myocarditis cases had 
symptoms. The others were asymptomatic. But uh, this study was criticized because there was no control group about what does the MRI look like in athletes. Um, there may be some features on the wall because we know in, in extreme marathon runners that the biomarkers of injury may be elevated. So this created a lot of controversy about whether there should be a long-term um, uh, re uh, restraint and or limitation on exercise and activity. And this has now reflected itself on some expert opinion consensus statements saying that there should be no exercise for at least two weeks for even amongst those who are asymptomatic and those who are with moderate or, moderate or severe symptoms, a longer convalescence and or recovery period with limitation of exercise. And uh, this is uh, a recommendation from European Association of Preventive Cardiology, which is stating that in athletes, there should be a limited uh, uh, recovery phase with a limitation of exercise and, and evaluation by a specialist that involves imaging and further diagnostic strategies and making sure that these studies are negative before they can go back. And this created a lot of controversy saying, should all the athletes be going through stress testing, imaging, MRI, and how often are we going to do it? When can they go back? Is it two weeks? Is it six months? This is very controversial at this point. This also touched on the pediatric population. Um, and American Academy of Pediatrics came with a guidance statement of limitation in sports physical activity after COVID uh, for children, recommending restriction for about three to six months for those with moderate or severe symptoms, uh, 14 days for mild symptoms. And injury mechanisms, um, as we had touched on in the pre-COVID era, we did have evidence of direct myocyte injury because the cardiac, uh, cardiotropic viruses could enter the cardiac myocytes. We know COVID SARS-CoV-2 can enter the cardiac myocyte because there's a receptor expression. Um, and, but in the former uh, myocarditis, we also had this evidence of lymphocytic myocarditis. And with SARS-CoV-2, we do have myocardial injury, but we're not seeing this lymphocytic myocarditis. In the initial cases, we saw the clinical presentation that's very typical of myocarditis. So the clinical features look like fulminant myocarditis. So from the clinical perspective and imaging perspective, everything fits. Um, then came the, the tissue studies looking at organ tropism, so measuring the RNA in the organs. And as you can see in the, the cardiac uh, 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 panel on the right side, there is evidence of SARS-CoV-2 in the, in the heart when you measure it in the heart. Uh, but when you look at the histology, and I know this may be a little bit challenging, but in the right lower panel where you see those uh, strips of muscle, that muscle strips don't look like chewed up myocarditis with lots of cells. That's what we normally expect in injured myocarditis um, in, with the viruses. So the myocytes, in essence, show very little cells, not fulminant. And um, there is some vacuolization by ultrastructure, by electron microscopy on the right side, but probably this may be of interest. We're able to see the virus particles um, in the, the cardiac tissue, but not in the cardiac myocytes. They're in the interstitium. So it's interesting. They're either coming there with an overspill and or through the circulation. And we're able to see them in the, in the endothelium or subendothelium but not inside the cardiac myocyte. And when we look at the macroscopy, and I'm hoping this is not too uh, grave images, um, the heart itself looks enlarged and stressed. There are uh, small clots in the lung tissues, which are seen throughout um, the, uh, the cross cuts. Uh, but again, we do not see fulminant chewed up myocytes that are seen on the left side. So, in essence, there's evidence of myocardial injury without the myocytes being chewed up. There's experimental models uh, demonstrating that the, um, the, the uptake of the SARS-CoV-2 happens in the cardiac myocyte, but it looks like the injury happens probably in the endothelial level and thus creates this inflammation and injury pattern, which actually was recognized as a multisystem inflammatory syndrome with a variety of other entities in children and was named as MERS or multi-system inflammatory syndrome and now we're finding that that's uh, prevalence 
even in the pediatric population is increasing and thus creating this uh, very interesting challenge for us of the paradigm of what are we going to call this entity because we're now calling them heart attacks and heart failure and shock difference but it probably is an entity with an underlying pathophysiology and as we're trying to target the treatment strategies maybe focus on that so in summary COVID-19 is associated with a variety of cardiovascular abnormalities ranging from the heart injury um, to pump function failure to shock to sudden death as well as clots um, acute injury of the heart is seen about um, um, 20 to 28 percent of the patients. By imaging, though, that prevalence is even higher in about two thirds of the patients. By cardiac MRI, which is very sensitive, um, by one report, um, the prevalence of abnormality was quite high, more than two thirds of the patients. Um, and in a college athlete study, in about 15 percent of the, the athletes, there was evidence of. Uh, MRI abnormality. The etiology of cardiac injury is not exactly clear. Despite we seeing it in the heart, it doesn't show the, the typical lymphocytic viral myocarditis that we're used to with the other viruses. It looks like it's an inflammation and injury at the vasculature, at the microvasculature with clots. Um, and the long-term effects will definitely require further data with both clinical laboratory biomarker, um, serology, as well as imaging. Um, and uh, the definitions of what we're going to call these things, I think we're looking at different portions of the elephant. I think it's a continuum of an inflammatory entity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Boskut. It's an excellent presentation. And the, I'm looking for the Q&A box. Please submit your question to Q&A. Yes, I see one question. Um, can there be, if there's no pre-existing cardiac... Yeah, go ahead, please. If, is there, if there's no pre-existing cardiac abnormality, can a new cardiac abnormality be developed? Yes. We do have evidence that even amongst individuals without pre-existing cardiovascular disease or without risk factors such as diabetes, hypertension, obesity, one can develop cardiac abnormality. The evidence is uh, the, the pediatric population and even the young adults. And we're seeing myocardial involvement either by cardiac throughput and I or images over there. And in the college athlete group that I presented, again, 15% having uh, MRI abnormality was quite concerning. But the other side of the coin, if people have pre-existing disease, the risk is higher. So if the, people, uh, if the patients have um, CAD, coronary artery disease, or heart failure, or diabetes, or hypertension, the risk of COVID complications is higher. I'm looking for any other questions? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm unable to enter. The okay, Q there's a one box. question from uh, Lily. Uh, what biomarkers would be indicative of patients who are recovering at home? Um, I would probably be cautious about indicated right now because indication for doing this at, at the population scale requires uh, validation studies for making sure that the, what we consider the decision making will and also the management will differ because we can do a variety of biomarkers. Right now I can come up with a panel of cardiac troponin um, natriuretic peptide levels, um, cytokine levels, um, and all of which can create its own panel. The problem is, is that going to change management? And is that because we will then need to uh, also look at the cost and risk because that will create further imaging and further maybe um, strategies. Sometimes doing more may result in more harm. So currently for the, the triage of how we manage um, uh, COVID is clinical with initial presentation and hypoxia, meaning if the patient is stable, not developing symptoms of hypoxia, they are usually at home. But we also look at other features, blood pressure, and overall um, um, level of um, energy and fatigue. If the patient is demonstrating very severe illness with hypoxia, usually they're being admitted to the hospital at that time. We do the biomarkers and looking at the features, we um, triage them to ICU. 
Those who are recovering at home, we are not doing biomarkers. But as part of a research protocol, what I would suggest is possibly looking at the cardiac troponin, maybe um, at a level of um, rapid testing for us to be able to determine um, return back to, uh, you know, athletes and or um, high, you know, uh, impact sports. Okay. I heard, Shankar, you have a question also. You can, uh, I know you cannot submit to Q&A, but can you speak? Um, th thank you. So, I mean, amazing presentation, uh, Dr. Boska. Thank you very much. I have two questions. One is, do antiplatelet treatments uh, change the cardiovascular injury? Because these have been tried in New York Presbyterian for quite some time. Yes. Now, and second yes. related question, do you see increased injury in atherosclerotic patients? And do you see uh, any uh, demonstration of, uh, I mean, uh, treatment for atherosclerosis reducing cardiac injury? Outstanding questions, Dr. Subramaniam. The, the first uh, question, question answer is yes. The, um, both the antithrombotic and antiplatelet. Right now, we are doing um, um, in the hospitalized patients with high features, uh, prophylaxis against clots. So most patients with, in the hospital, because they're in bedridden, already require the prophylaxis with blood thinners. Um, and we now are using the blood thinners in a much more proactive and um, um, risk benefit uh, strategy um, in most patients with COVID. And it's not solely antiplatelet, it's also anti-clot. So that's the one answer. In terms of the atherosclerosis, the um, other treatment strategies, such as statins and um, the other uh, cardiovascular disease modifying agents, such as ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, currently there are population-based cohort studies demonstrating that there's potentially protection with ARBs and ACE inhibitors, meaning um, we want our patients with pre-existing disease to continue their medications unless they're in shock. There appears to be protection against injury, and there's probably a um, protection against the receptor expression in the body, the balance. And for that reason, um, whether to initiate these as a pre proactive, uh, prospective manner for non-cardiovascular uh, disease patients is remaining to be seen, whether statins are going to be protective for others or not. But so far, um, treatment for cardiovascular disease appears to be protective um, if continued, and unless, of course, the patient is in shock. The, yesterday, there was a Nature paper showing that those with probably abnormal vessel wall probably will be more prone to further injury. And what is an abnormal vessel wall? Could be atherosclerosis. And that appears to be the feature why they have such obesity, diabetes. The vessel wall is abnormal in those individuals, and those are the high-risk patients. Dr. Boskut, was amazing talk. I highly appreciate on behalf of organizing committee. And the, before we go to the, our second distinguished speakers, I would like to check if Dr. Fukuda is on the panel. Dr. Fukuda? Okay. I don't see him. And uh, our next speaker, next plenary speaker, Professor Crystal Wong. Uh, she is the head of the Department of Head and Skin at Ghent. In university in Belgium. Uh, she was trained in London at the Yale School of Medicine, uh, Connecticut, and the University of Stellenbosch, South Africa. Uh, she is the fellow of the ENA and the member of EU task, Joint Task Force of International League Against Epilepsy. Uh, she is also the founding member of the International Neuromodulation Task Force for COVID-19. Her research focuses on epilepsy, neuromodulation, bioelectronic medicine. I had a great pleasure to hosting her almost two weeks ago for the Brain Initiative, and I'm delighted to see her back again. Dr. Wong. Thank you, Dr. Um, Aka, for um, introducing me. Thank you for the first speaker for giving this nice introduction already on the heart, and there is an increasing interest in heart and brain interaction. But again, I must say that um, it appears that the cardiologists have progressed further in giving guidance and guidelines compared to neurologists uh, for the moment. Um, so I am going to talk to you a little bit about the challenges related to brain and neurological diseases. 
Um, clearly, the context is the COVID-19 pandemic. And actually, already early on, in December 2019, there was some evidence already for some association of this disorder with neurological signs, symptoms and some diseases. And ever since, there is an increasing number of reports on neurological features. And that's made me think in, in March, more or less, when we went into lockdown and initially we had some more time, to review um, these reported neurological disorders. And of course, after me, there were uh, others or at the same time of me. And actually it has become clear that um, infection um, with SARS-CoV-2 is able to affect both the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, and relate to that also the muscle. And um, again, a little bit the same approach as um, um, my, the previous speaker. What can we learn or what did we learn from a neurological point of view of previous respiratory infections or coronavirus infections? So we know that we have six coronaviruses that are able to infect humans. Um, four of them are seasonal and only give mild uh, upper respiratory tract infections. Uh, but they do account for up to 30% of these uh, respiratory uh, tract infections every year globally. And two of the coronaviruses have appeared to be more uh, dangerous in the sense that they have caused major um, epidemics. And uh, we know them, they appeared in 2002 and 2012. And in these uh, epidemics, um, we have some reports already on occasional CNS and PNS uh, um, diseases reported. You see some of them here, like encephalopathy series. Um, also, this cardiovascular disease and protombotic state was recognized, but only occasionally in these um, times. Let's see. Okay. So, for SARS CoV 1, um, there is certainly some evidence of invasion of the nervous system and the muscle based on autopsy studies that were performed in these days. And also um, a bit in analogy to the histology images that we saw from the previous speaker, but in this case uh, for SARS-CoV-1, there is viral RNA detected, or there was in these autopsy cases, in cytoplasm of hypothalamic um, neurons and also of cerebral cortical neurons. And also important to note is that there were clear signs of real degeneration and necrosis uh, of neurons demyelinization was not uh, present. However, the exact root of how this uh, type of virus infects the brain in the human um, is not known. One of the hypotheses was that um, infected monocytes that travel in the bloodstream um, arrive also in the area of or the circulation of the brain and in this way are able to migrate and um, uh, go across the so-called blood-brain barrier. Um, however, true clinical series of SARS patients with neurological manifestations were unavailable and there's almost a complete absence of clinical information or pathological data with regards to the brain um, in uh, MERS cases. There are some, uh, there is some information on other respiratory viruses, for instance, uh, pandemic seasonal influenza has been associated with what we call acute necrotizing encephalopathy, and I will show you some cases later on. Um, also encephalopathy in children and uh, myelopathy in adults, but basically um, 2009, the influenza um, epidemic at that time um, caused neurological disease in only one to two per thousand, hundred thousand patients. Um, so for now, we could say that neurological complications are relatively rare in uh, SARS, MERS, and even in COVID-19, you will see. But of course, due to the scale of the pandemic, even these small percentages, and you can see the prevalences here of CNS and PNS uh, with SARS and MERS, even these small percentages may of course lead to a, a total larger number of cases. And for instance, in one of the publications, uh, most recent publications that gives again an overview of the reported cases more recently than my own publication, namely in September, when there were 5 million cases of infected um, uh, people worldwide. Well, we can estimate that 10,000 of these uh, people uh, have central nervous system uh, disorders and 
8,000 river system disorders. And in the meantime, one of the more recent nature papers states that 20 million people in, in, uh, are currently uh, affected, uh, which makes um, that these numbers have in the meantime also um, increased. Now, uh, one of the most recent papers is indeed uh, reporting neurological disorders in September 2020. At that time, there are about 900 well-established neurology cases where there's a clear um, evidence also of uh, a patient positively, positively infected. Um, these cases I would like to discuss with you in a little bit more detail. Now, these neurology cases um, may be due to so-called non-specific neurological complications of systemic disease. We have seen in the previous lecture that indeed uh, COVID-19 gives rise to a severe inflammatory reaction in the brain, uh, in the body, and this may um, lead also to neurological complications. On the other hand, there might be true direct effects of the virus on the nervous system. Um, there might be an inflammation of the nervous system and in particular also of the vasculature in the nervous system. And these things may also be combined and occur at the same time of the uh, primary infection or what we typically often see in neurological disorders as a so-called uh, post-infectious immune-mediated disease where basically you have um, an innate um, response of your own body towards um, the, uh, the, the first infection, the virus, but also an abnormal development of antibodies that cross-react with some of the um, nervous tissue that you have, leading to so-called autoimmune disease with some delay after the initial um, infection. Um, let's... Um, speak about antis. There are certainly cases reported um, with COVID-19. So encephalitis is an inflammation of the brain parenchyma that is caused uh, by in the infection itself and also by the body's own immune defense reaction. Typically, this is a pathological diagnosis, but for practical reasons, we often rely on typical clinical evidence of brain inflammation, of typical findings in the cerebrospinal fluid, such as an increase in protein levels or an increase in um, lymphocytic um, uh, cells. Uh, we might find uh, typical imaging abnormalities and even focal EEG abnormalities um, on, the e on the EEG recordings. What is important to realize is that even if there is detection of the virus in the cerebrospinal fluid, this does not necessarily mean that we are speaking here about an encephalitis. It is different from brain inflammation, a little bit similar to what I heard from the previous speaker. Um, there might be virus somewhere close in the vicinity of the heart. That doesn't mean that you have a typical myocarditis. Uh, for now, there are about eight cases that have been reported. Um, and four of these patients were women. Um, typically, the neurological symptoms occurred at the same time as the respiratory sim symptoms, but in some patients up to 17 days later. Um, in one of the patients, confusion preceded um, the typical symptoms of COVID-19, such as um, cough and fever. And in uh, two patients, there was fever without any respiratory symptoms. For the rest, basically the symptomatology that we see is quite typical for encephalitis and should be recognized by neurologists in this way. If we look in the cerebrospinal fluid of some patients who had lumbar punctures, um, in the majority of them, there was indeed an increase in white blood cells. Uh, um, in one, well, there was a normal cerebrospinal fluid, and then um, of the patients who did receive um, cerebrospinal fluid examination, only one was positive for um, truly uh, presence of uh, RNA of the virus in the cerebrospinal fluid. Six MRIs uh, were normal, and two had typical findings, like you see here on the right bottom um, in this uh, flare image of this patient with an increased intensity in the medial temporal lobe region. The EEG has not been proven so successful um, as a diagnostic tool in COVID-19 patients. Typically, it shows generalized slowing in these patients. Um, in two of them, there were some focal abnormalities. There are no specific treatments available for encephalitis in these patients. Um, one of them responded to high dosages of cortico treatment, and in the others, 
anticonvulsants, antiviral treatments, and even antibiotic treatments were provided in these patients. Another frequently reported um, finding has been the broad entity of encephalopathy. Um, so encephalopathy, the word itself says it, it is a disease of the brain. Uh, so it's actually a pathobiological process in the brain that usually develops over hours um, to days and is associated with changes in personality, behavior, cognition, and even consciousness. Um, it is important to um, recognize that there are many causes for patients um, to have encephalopathy, certainly when they are severely ill. And we need to consider these causes even in patients that are now infected uh, without COVID-19, but do not have other clear um, um, signs of brain inflammation. And these are, for instance, hypoxia, um, which is, of course, very prevalent in the severe COVID-19 patients, drugs, toxins, and other metabolic disturbances. There is a nice series already published in March, April, I think, of this year. The eight patients um, at the intensive care unit in two French hospitals were reported. They report up to 84% of neurological complications in patients in the ICU. Of the majority of them had indeed a, an encephalopathy and when MRI was performed, although only in 13 patients, there was some um, increased signal in the leptomeningeal region in this patient. Maybe most importantly, when these patients were weaned off um, sedative drugs, when a neuromuscular blockade was decreased, and patients were ready to be discharged from the intensive care unit that up to one third of these patients presented with some kind of this executive syndrome um, upon discharge, meaning they do not respond normally um, when um, they are, they are um, addressed um, and they have some inattention uh, problems, which seems quite high um, for this population. This, or there's one case report with this so-called necrotizing encephalopathy on MRI. You see here the devastating images um, on the right in the right top. Uh, only one report for the moment. This is classified also under the broad scope of encephalopathy. Um, in children, there have been reports, um, if we think about uh, changes in consciousness um, in two children um, without respiratory uh, symptoms, but with a positive um, swap for coronavirus. And a very nice series published from Italy um, in 168 uh, children and adolescents reports seizures in children um, with a prevalence of 3%. Although importantly, um, in three of these patients, there was already a pre-existing epilepsy. And in one uh, case, um, there was previous, um, uh, there was a history of uh, febrile uh, seizures. Um, this brings me to, um, autoimmune uh, features of um, post or para infectious disorders and one of the well-known disorders that we um, see is so-called acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. Um, this is a syndrome of multifocal demyelinization in the brain that typically occurs only weeks after a primary infection and that is characterized by focal neurological symptoms and some um, grades of encephalopathy also. For now, there are two reports of, um, uh, and of, of this um, disorder with typical ab MRI abnormalities. These patients had a normal cerebrospinal fluid analysis and these patients indeed presented at onset with focal neurological um, disorders or with encephalopathic uh, signs. Both patients were still positive for um, virus at the moment that this diagnosis was made and both patients recovered the MRI recovered after treatment with immunoglobulins or corticoid treatment. There is one report of um, an infection of the spinal cord, uh, inflammation of the spinal cord, excuse me, and this patient presented with a flaccid paraparesis and incontinence. Um, what is important in these um, inflammatory situations both for ADEM and for uh, myelitis, um, is that typically we treat these patients indeed with immunosuppressants like immunoglobulins and high doses of corticosteroids. But instead of the typical situation that we see in neurology that these syndromes occur after weeks um, following the primary infection, 
the patients that are reported now were still positive for the coronavirus too at the time of the diagnosis. So in this um, instance, we might be cautious in um, using these uh, immunosuppressive therapies um, uh, in the sense that um, you might also suppress the immune to the virus itself in, this, uh, in these patients. If we look at uh, peripheral nervous system and muscle disease, there are some reports um, or a, rather a lot of reports um, of patients with the so-called Guillain-Barre syndrome. This is again a typically post-infectious situation. It is in, uh, an acute polyradiculopathy that is rapidly progressive and is characterized by symmetrical limb weakness, uh, decreases of the reflexes in the limbs, and in some patients also um, with, uh, associated with some facial weakness. The um, danger in this situation is that it is rapidly progressive and it tends to um, lead to um, um, decrease um, of your um, respiratory muscle strength also if you do not control it in time. Um, for now, um, even if there are 19 cases reported, the incidence seems not particularly high than expected. The neurological symptom onset, um, the medium time was seven days um, after um, the onset of COVID-19, which is relatively fast compared to uh, other Guillain-Barre syndromes uh, that we know. For the rest, the uh, clinical and the technical examinations are quite typical as other uh, syndromes that we know of. Um, so uh, patients, again, 16 of the 19 patients still were positive for the virus at the time of the, the presentation of the Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, and again, this, this syndrome is typically treated with high dosages of um, immunosuppressants. Two patients um, died, um, but they died of their um, assumed that to die of their uh, respiratory rather than of their neurological uh, problem. 12 patients improved but were, and five of them were discharged with disability. Now what has um, arisen uh, in particular um, in COVID-19 uh, more and more is um, the loss of your smell and the loss of taste that we denominate as anosmia and agusia. It has emerged more and more as a common syndrome it can um, present itself isolated or together with other symptoms uh, typical for COVID-19. But what is quite um, peculiar and interesting is that it may occur often in the absence of typical nasal congestion or other rhinorrhea um, or coryza syndrome symptoms. Um, so uh, in prospective, while in the beginning, in the early series uh, coming from China, it was reported only in 5 to 10 percent of the patients. It has now become clear in a prospective European study, for instance, that up to 80 percent of the patients have olfactory dysfunction and gustatory dysfunction. In 10 percent of the cases, this precedes the respiratory symptoms, and 40 percent of the patients tend to recover from these symptoms one to two weeks. Um, but it will remains to be seen what happens to the other 60%. And there are some reports already that these symptoms may uh, persist for a longer period of time. Um, this seems to be clearly more frequent than the historical cohort of influenza patients. It has been proposed to be a good diagnostic market, but this marker uh, for COVID-19, but this will have to remain um, to be shown in more prospective studies. And of course, this I will come to this a little bit later, um, this has uh, brought IDs to a potential entry path of the, of the virus to the brain. Uh, another important um, issue is cerebrovascular disorders, and I heard it already in the previous speech. Um, in September 2020, there were uh, over 90 cases of stroke reported um, during uh, the pandemic. Um, 18 patients uh, died. What is important to realize, this seems quite high, but but most were indeed more than 60 years old. And there is a, in all these patients, there was a high prevalence of other stroke risk factors. There is one case series from New York City where apparently five, week, five patients under the age of 50 were admitted um, within uh, um, two weeks. And actually two of them had no other COVID symptoms. 
and most of them were large vessel strokes and this seems to be a quite high number to be admitted in such a short period of time. So the onset of the respiratory um, symptoms um, was um, in the mean uh, 10 days, but sometimes at the same time and sometimes later. Patients often have multiple infarcts. Uh, there is often association uh, with or other arterial uh, thrombosis, limb ischemia, deep venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolisms. Um, and many patients um, with COVID-19 and critical illnesses have indeed eat elevated D-dimer levels. Um, for now, there are ongoing trials to investigate what the exact role of uh, anticoagulants may be in patients with COVID-19 and their um, effects on stroke incidence. Now, just to, um, to uh, go a little bit faster and end my talk, what about the physiology? Um, is there a route of entry into the nervous system? That's, of course, what neurologists are very much interested in. And I pointed out to you already that indeed the olfactory bulb is not, it is a potential entry route. It is an entry, known entry route for uh, herpes simplex virus. We know that many patients have anosmia and in mouse models, it has been demonstrated that indeed the virus may spread through the olfactory nerve to many other regions in the brain. Also brainstem centers controlling um, cardiac uh, centers that may play a role in um, sudden death in patients uh, with COVID-19. Other uh, potential um, trajectories are a, uh, the passing of the virus uh, through the bloodstream and crossing of the blood-brain barrier, infected leukocytes, and we do know that indeed uh, the vascular endothelium has receptors for ACE2 uh, and that uh, the SARS-CoV-2 is able to replicate in neuronal cells in vitro uh, settings. Now, the damage to the central and the peripheral nervous system may be directly by the virus, but may also be due to the immune, the immune response of the host to the infection or a combination of, of both. And currently, there is actually not such a clear evidence of a true high neurovirulence, um, meaning that um, there doesn't seem to be a true destruction of neurons, a little bit in similarity to what I've heard of the myocardial cells in the first lecture. Uh, with regards to the pathophysiology of cerebrovascular disease, there indeed an increased coagu coagulopathy. It seems to be um, in that way. I have listed here several reasons why this uh, may be, and most um, clearly it seems to be that endothelial cells in the, um, in the vascular structure are sensitive for um, infection with uh, the virus, and this endotheliitis may promote vasoconstriction edema in a pro-coagulate state, leading to indeed an increased risk for um, cerebrovascular disease in COVID-19 patients. On the other hand, it's well known that an inflammatory process in itself can cause an acute infection, uh, caused by an acute infection, can destabilize placus in patients, can trigger atrial fibrillation, and in this way leading to ischemic stroke. So how do we investigate neurology uh, in COVID-19 area? Well, there was a true challenge, of course, when we needed to manage patients with, with highly contagious disease and an overwhelming number of COVID-19 diseases. And for that reason, in many early reports, there is insufficient detail on cerebrospinal fluid analysis, imaging, and follow-up. So it is clear now that clinicians, neurologists in particular, must adopt a methodological approach to um, investigate patients with possible COVID-19 and associated neurological disorders. And clear um, definitions have now been proposed um, by the World Health Organization that should be used and they can be found um, in this uh, publication here. Um, with regards to infection and inflammation, uh, we have to uh, realize that due to the fact that COVID-19 is now very prevalent in hospital, uh, we always have to exclude other infectious cause causes that um, we still need to investigate um, encephalitis cases with typical findings uh, for encephalitis and not uh, just because the virus in CSF doesn't mean that your patient has an encephalitis. If patients have an altered consciousness, indeed, we have to consider all the other uh, potential um, disturbances that may re uh, lead to an encephalopathy. 
And um, of course, the most challenging part is uh, patients with stroke. Is there a true causal relationship with um, COVID-19? Um, this will have to be demonstrated also from prospective series that are now being uh, investigated. Um, I'm going to briefly uh, skip this to allow still some time for, co for questions. In conclusion, I can state that case control studies will be needed to establish whether uh, SARS-CoV-2 is causal or coincidental for neurological disorders. It is clear that this increased uh, coagulability and uh, cerebrovascular disorder um, is rather rare for other viral infections, but seems to be very important as a complication of COVID-19. Um, um, the whole proportion of patients with neurological disease is, is still low compared to the death due to the respiratory disease in COVID-19. Um, but of course, if uh, it is estimated that 80% of the world population will get infected, indeed neurological cases, uh, cases will become large and there might be um, a potentially large health, socio and economic uh, problem there. Still important um, is that we as neurologists guarantee medical care also for non-communicable uh, neurological disease, for neurological emergencies, that we are able to continue our chronic therapy in particular in patients that require immune suppressive therapies. And um, for that reason, there is a EIN, EAN, uh, European Academy of Neurology COVID task force established to guide neurologists and help them in uh, caring uh, for patients with COVID-19 and for our non-communicable uh, neurological disorders uh, also. Thank you. Attention. Well, thank you so much for this exceptional talk. And any questions, if you have any questions, please submit your questions through Q&A. There's a one question. Uh, from Marios uh, from Crete. Uh, question is whether COVID-19 can be caused from other brain diseases? I'm not exactly sure um, what you mean from other brain diseases. So COVID-19 has been, has, give, has been given that name as it has, as it is caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus and is associated with this typical uh, respiratory disorder. Um, so caused by other brain diseases, um, not exactly. By other viruses, yes. By other, other viruses, such as, for instance, the herpes simplex virus, that is a well-known virus for us to cause neurological disorders. Um, I don't think it gives the typical respiratory or inflammatory hyperreactions as we see in COVID-19. Um, so in that case, um, I, I think my answer would be no. Um, if, if that's exactly what, what you mean, Marius. Okay. Hey, one more question. Can you please comment on the multiple sclerosis and COVID-19? That's a, a very interesting topic. It's a, it's a topic on its own from um, various uh, parts. There was an initial concern that because many of our multiple sclerosis patients are being treated with immunosuppressant uh, therapies, um, that maybe we would have to stop these therapies because these patients would be more uh, prone um, for COVID-19. But from from the prospect collection and also retro some retrospective analysis, this doesn't seem to be the case. So we have decided now, together with the EIN uh, task force, to just continue therapy in these patients, and there doesn't seem to be a big problem. Um, on the other hand, from a pathological point of view, there have been some studies in the past demonstrating that um, post-mortem um, investigations in patients with multiple sclerosis, that in these patients, in the brains of these patients, coronaviruses have been detected. So from a pathophysiological point of view, that this is an interesting finding. For the moment, there seems not to be a dramatic um, problem with keeping normal treatment in patients with multiple sclerosis. Okay. Well, we appreciate for this wonderful talk. We will keep in touch. Thank you so much Thank again. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Toros? Okay. 
Our next speaker is, I cannot see him. Dr. John Torres. Uh, meeting, I don't see John on the panel. He just popped up to, to, uh, five, ten minutes ago. And yeah, I think he must have connection issues here. Uh, okay. Since I Lisa, said Lisa, if yeah, Lisa is about... available, Lisa Cosimi, Lisa. Okay, cheers. Oh, yeah, I can do that. Let me just. I think we can switch between Lisa. We and, did already. Uh, yes, thank yeah, you. We John did already. And, yeah. Um, call, I mean, uh, all of, please inform John that he should join. I already in. informed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. It's a great okay. honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Lisa Cosimi. She is uh, currently a professor at Harvard Medical School and the, she completed her residency internal medicine and primary care at the mass general hospital and infectious disease training at mass general brigham Com combined fellowship uh, as a researcher she has spent her career focusing on improved health system and quality health care in resource limited settings and the, we are delighted to have her with us today lisa please Thank you very much for having me. Um, it's really been a pleasure to be a part of this, this panel um, and, and listen to these uh, diverse and, and really exciting talks. You know, I think that's one thing about, um, about this, this pandemic and this, um, this infection that's you know, brought so many of us from so many diverse fields uh, together. Sorry, I'm talking as I just load my slides here. Um, uh, to you know, to, to to try to attack what is clearly a um, a problem across multiple specialties and um, expertises. So with that, let me. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to talk today. Can you see? You can't see. Hold on. my share screen. Give me. Okay, I think we're gonna here. I'm gonna talk today, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit um, from the, the clinical realm where I spend most of my time. I'm actually an ID doc at the, at the Brigham, um, but I do a lot of um, health systems work are you seeing the test Boston slide right now? The big slide? Yes, we do. Okay, great. great. Thank you, Lisa. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so I do, I spend um, my clinical work doing infectious diseases in the hospital. And then I do, uh, my research uh, has been in health systems and, and um, studying why um, disparities or gaps in health systems lead to um, challenges in quality of care. And, you know, little did I know that my experience internationally was going to um, really uh, come home to roost in the response to this, this uh, challenge um, with COVID-19. So I have no disclosures. Uh, and before I get started, I do want to recognize um, what I'm going to describe um, our effort in, in at-home testing. And this has been a huge collaborative effort between the Brigham and Women's Hospital, the Broad Institute, um, multiple teams uh, within both of those uh, institutes, as well as um, a um, collaboration with Mask on Medical, with uh, GBF, who is doing kitting for us, and UPS, who is doing all of our um, shipping and logistics. And this is also on behalf of my co-PIs, Ann Woolley and Deb Hung. And this whole team has really been on daily Zoom calls over the last um, six months trying to, trying to get this, this, um, this project up and running. So just to start us off, and again, as I said, I'm going to shift gears to the more public health systems work. Um, 
and try to give you a little bit of a sense what we were going through um, and what all of us I know are, have been going through, but um, sort of how this all started. When um, this COVID time, uh, timeline, we're all quite familiar with at this point, but I'm gonna just go through an abbreviated um, uh, timeline with a little bit of local um, perspective. So we um, started hearing about um, this cluster of cases in um, Wuhan, China in late uh, December of 2019. And in early January, the WHO announced that um, uh, this was a coronavirus uh, pneumonia. And very soon thereafter, we started hearing about reports of healthcare worker infections and, and already um, uh, a system starting to be a bit overwhelmed um, in Wuhan. And of course, Wuhan entered um, quarantine in late January. Now, most of my work is in Vietnam uh, and uh, I have a large team on the ground in Vietnam and we were in intense discussions about what we were gonna do um, with our team um, in Vietnam um, and our response in Vietnam. And we knew that the Lunar New Year holidays were coming up, which was going to mean a lot of travel around Asia. And we were expecting a big outbreak um, in Vietnam and trying to prepare for that. And in late January, we, of course, started to hear about cases um, throughout uh, Thailand, Nepal, Japan, Korea, um, in the U.S. related to a travel um, uh, case and then um, initially in Vietnam. Now, interestingly, Vietnam, um, and I won't talk about that in this in this. Um, in this uh, talk, but Vietnam has controlled their um, uh, epidemic remarkably well. I mean, they really are one of the shining stars and one of the things that they are doing incredibly well, which is testing and tracing is, is what I'm gonna talk about, what we are not doing well and have not done well in the US. So as we entered into late January, early February, um, speaking specifically around the Brigham and, and, and MGH, the MGB system, there was increasing alarm and minimal testing. And, and, and I think a well-known story at this point that the, um, the testing uh, capacity capability um, was really quite fumbled um, by our federal government um, in, in the US. And if you look at mid-February with what we now know was a growing community spread, uh, there were only 1,600 tests performed. In late February, and I will just note that in, uh, there was school vacation mid-February, again, more travel. And then finally in February, late February, February 25th, a Seattle teenager who had no, no travel whatsoever, no contacts, um, was confirmed to be positive, and that was the clear first indication that there was community spread in the U.S. Um, meanwhile, we are hearing um, one of the one of the uh, the things that I think really started to strike us here um, in the Boston area and, and, and in many areas. But what we were talking a lot about was just watching what we, what our Italian colleagues were going through in late February and just knowing what was likely coming. Now, from a more personal level, again, we were getting MGB is what used to be known as partners, but Mass General Brigham, that we were getting system-wide e emails about um, travel restrictions, PPE conservation, Purell conservation, um, but really nothing about, um, or very little about testing. And ooh, I already see a mistake in my slides. Let me just delete that. Um, won't be able to delete that. Um, so, uh, what what happened here was that we had a, um, a bio threats pager. So the, on the infectious disease um, uh, on the infectious disease uh, uh, division, we were responsible for approving any test that needed to be done. Um, and that and sorry, I covered it up, but that's a pager, of course. And we were our job was to basically decide if a test was appropriate. And at that time, the only tests that were approved, everything had to go through the Mass Department of public health and then approved by CDC as well, was essentially someone who had fever, cough, shortness of breath, so signs of a respiratory viral infection in the lower respiratory tract, um, and either a contact with someone with COVID or travel to an area. So in that, it, by the, here it was um, Italy and, and in China for the most part, Korea, Japan, um, or severe respiratory distress in the hospital or um, in the intensive care unit with no other identified um, illness. And that, that was really the only people we could get tested. Um, so if you think about um, uh, just the, the we, were, we were sort of the gatekeepers at that point, and it was really an uncomfortable place um, to be, and we knew we weren't testing enough people. 
So as um, we rolled into late March, there was increased amount of testing, um, but it was, it, it was still limited and, um, and it still remains limited to date. And so at the time we were identifying really only the tip of the iceberg. And so these are pictures of course from um, testing, um, testing sites. And if you think about the, um, the resources that are needed to set up um, these types of um, testing sites, with PPE, the, the costs, um, that so the, the the human costs and the and the and the monetary costs to set up these um, these testing sites, they're immense, um, and the number of people that you can test based uh, compared to what we need to test, um, even to this date, um, remains small. The other thing we were starting to see um, back then and what continues to be highlighted now is that um, COVID has again highlighted um, existing social inequities of health. Now this, um, these types of graphs are not new to those of us who have worked in HIV, who have worked in tuberculosis um, and have worked um, uh, in, in, um, in public health uh, in other areas, both locally and globally. Um, but this has really brought um, these inequities to the, to the front page media at this point. And, you know, we were certainly seen in the hospitals and continue to see now that, um, you know, that there are um, immense disparities, both with regards to who has access to testing, who can get testing, and um, who's getting sick from this illness. The other thing I wanted to highlight is um, what's um, quite clear now is that um, there is a um, large prevalence of um, asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection. And um, this uh, paper back in uh, June of 2020 looked at the pool data from 16 cohorts, so over 45,000 um, uh, uh, patients and found that 40 to 45 percent of those who were infected with SARS-CoV-2 were asymptomatic and then modeling studies were done on that which estimate that asymptomatic individuals account for greater than 50 percent of transmission um, and the recommendation at this point really started to re um, became, uh, uh, recommended that, that more asymptomatic individuals be tested. Now I think you know there's a lot of um, there's um, still debate here and I think um, a healthy debate about who of these asymptomatics are really the, the ones that are, are transmitting and it probably is um, there are many factors including um, the level of virus in their um, in their upper airways how, how many people they come in contact with um, and the, but this does um, highlight um, a that we're not testing that B, B the tests that we're doing are not good enough to tell us who are these high transmitters um, and really remains one of the challenges for our, hopefully people that are um, attending this symposium to, to keep tackling. So testing now, um, many bottlenecks um, which continue. There's limited number of testing locations and times. There's, um, so if, if there's uh, workers that can't take off work, if they're, they work, um, uh, during the day or if they're working at night and they have to sleep during the day, they, they may not have access to testing. People that live um, away from testing sites and don't have cars can't drive to get it. There's lack of point of care testing. The turnaround time remains slow, even though it has improved from, um, you know, weeks to days. And in some, in some places, uh, we're getting results in 24 hours. Still not fast enough, frankly. Um, stockouts continue. Um, in the large labs, especially in reagents and supplies, it was the um, it was the swabs earlier in the pandemic. Now it remains the the reagents and the pipette tips. Uh, and then the testing is really limiting the overall lab capacity for other testing. Uh, and so we're seeing in our um, you know in our in our hospital in our lab, which is a fantastic lab, they are um, if we order um, other. Uh, PCR tests or other special cultures for antibiotic susceptibility, they really have to prioritize what they can do and can't do in any given one day. And then um, just the human factor, a lot of fear and stigma around testing positive, whether um, it be because they uh, uh, can't take the time off work because they're the only, um, you know, only person bringing a paycheck home to their family, 
um, or because there really is um, stigma in communities around testing positive. We've heard that over and over again from patients. So all of this results in not enough people being tested, late presentations to care with more severe disease, um, delays in and an overwhelmed contact tracing system with more infection propagation, lack of a clear picture of who is or who has been infected, delays in care from new and chronic disease. We were um, seen and, and continue to see people not wanting to come into the hospital because they're afraid. They're afraid of, um, of contracting uh, COVID by going out or by going into the hospital. And so they're not coming in, for example, their um, diabetic foot, their new ulcer, um, if they have diabetes, their diabetic foot ulcer or new symptoms that may be indicative of um, of um, cardiac disease, and then ongoing racial and socioeconomic disparities. So, um, so where are we today? This is um, the data from the um, COVID exit strategy on the left and the New York Times on the right. So the entire country is um, in the red with regards to um, uncontrolled spread, save a few, um, a few areas and um, cases are going up. And I think for um, you know, two weeks ago, people were continuing to say, well, cases are going up, but um, hospitalizations and death remain, remain flat. And, and, and I think that argument is now no longer holds water. Um, didn't for us anyway, um, two weeks ago, but now it's, it's very clear that both hospitalizations and deaths are going, around, going up around the country. So, so what's needed? Um, there's many things that are needed. I'm going to focus on testing as part of the strategy here. Um, so it, it's amazing that we're still saying this so many months in, but there's there needs there's an in, a need for increased access to testing, especially for the most vulnerable and at risk populations. So people who are very much um, on the front lines, essential workers, teachers, K through 12. Um, hospital workers, and it needs to be rapid. Um, we, are, we are still, we don't have systems that are rapid enough, and it needs to be connected to um, uh, contact tracing and um, to the healthcare system. So ideally we would have, and then so we're really focused on here, um, ideally we would have very rapid point of care testing um, with answers within minutes with an immediate connection to contact tracing and healthcare. And, and then also ideally we do this broadly and longitudinally to track this over time. So I'm gonna shift a little bit to, um, to what we have available right now. I'm not gonna focus on what are the many different diagnostics in development, um, but we'll focus on what's, what's available right now. So essentially we have molecular tests and those are gonna detect um, genetic material from the virus antigen tests, which are gonna detect proteins from the virus, um, and then antibody tests, which detect proteins in the blood made in response to infection with the virus, all in fairly simplistic terms. So if you look at rapid antigen testing, the one that's been um, most widely deployed at this point is the, um, is the Binax, the Binax Now. Um, it's um, a rapid, inexpensive antigen card. It's point of care. Uh, results can turn around in about 15 minutes. Limitations are there. It's a bit lower sensitivity compared to RT-PCR. The clinical performance depends on certain circumstances. For example, um, uh, if it's in the cold, so if you're at a testing site um, and it, it's cold, the, the test performs uh, not as well. And it's not currently approved for asymptomatic testing. Now, some of that may be, sorry, some of that may be um, okay if you have a, um, a, a um, if you're really trying to detect who is most infectious, you could hypothesize a, a strategy where you're really trying to, the, to figure out the ones that um, have the viral, the highest viral load. It hasn't been shown yet that that's what this detects. Um, but there are some that are um, talking about using a test that's less sensitive and use, using it more frequently. Um, molecular testing includes the PCR test that the majority um, uh, um, of testing sites are using at this point. So this um, nasopharyngeal swab, which some people have um, 
which some people have um, uh, experienced yourselves. It's incredibly unpleasant. Um, uh, patients hate it. Um, saliva, which is uh, easier, uh, but has not been able to be deployed, easier to, to do from a, a, um, an on your own type manner, uh, but hasn't been able to be scaled up in, um, in large scale. And then this anterior nasal swab testing, which the Broad is using um, in very high throughput, um, uh, in a very high throughput manner, which is much more comfortable um, for, for patients and is now approved for observed um, self-testing. So we, um, so let me tell you a little bit about Test Boston and, and what we're trying to do to, um, improve the systems around testing in a, in a study standpoint at this point. Um, our goals for Test Boston is that we want to measure the prevalence of COVID-19 in the Boston metropolitan area and, um, and also be able to tell what's happening in individual communities. We're trying to create a sentinel system for measuring COVID-19 activity in the community and we're partnering and empowering patients by providing access to testing, particularly in underserved communities in order to link to medical care and address health inequities. We um, hope to determine if seropositivity and what, if so, what antibody levels might correlate with immune protection and develop antibody, I'm sorry, develop a model to implement, implement large scale at home testing for COVID-19 and other infections. So the logistics and really what we're doing is we're enrolling 10,000 individuals in the greater Boston area. This is through invitation, um, through uh, those that are interested uh, can come into the, the, the Test Boston site and fill out a little survey, and um, then they will get an invitation to, to enroll. Um, with that, they will do monthly viral using the anterior self swab and a serology test for the finger stick, um, a finger stick for, um, for antibodies. And uh, we'll also be uh, rolling in next month testing for symptomatic patients so they can request a test if they become symptomatic. This is entirely virtual. Um, everything is at home. There's an online consent. The kit is sent um, out to them uh, through UPS and then it's returned overnight to the road. It's all self-administered and um, individuals get their viral test results uh, the next day. Um, some of the logistics, uh, and so what's happening is that the patients will be enrolled um, and consented through the online portal. They're, um, they get an initial kit, they return that, and then every month thereafter on a rolling basis, as people enroll, um, they get a monthly kit and that will go on for six months. Um, in month, I have it here as um, day 90, we're hoping to get that a little bit sooner. Um, we'll be able to start rolling in um, um, these ad hoc testing kits for symptomatic. So the procedure is that the sample kit gets delivered to their home via UPS. They collect um, an anterior nasal swab, self-collect it. They collect a, um, they do a finger prick for a dried blood spot and then UPS returns the sample to the road for overnight delivery. The viral diagnostic test is completed um, at the Broad. It's done on the same, um, the same platform that the Broad is using for its um, high through throughput testing. And I should just say that the, for those that don't know the Broad, they're now doing um, the majority of testing for um, New England and um, about a tenth of all testing in the U.S. right now via their high throughput um, robotic system. The serology testing is um, completed also in the road, um, but in batches uh, uh, via a high throughput um, ELISA system. Those tests, that is um, a research test and development, so we're currently not returning those re results to individuals in the study, but we'll be releasing those um, in aggregate um, to individuals in the study and to the, to the public as, as the batches are completed. So some of the uniqueness of the, of the, the test, uh, Test Boston, is that um, it's really a collaboration and we're really trying to build this further collaboration between the community, the hospitals, and the Department of Public Health. We, um, we rolled out about one month ago at this point and 5,000 folks have enrolled so far. 
Um, there are, we are still obviously actively enrolling and we expect to complete full enro enrollment within eight weeks of launch. Um, really hoping to empower and partner our communities uh, to have individuals who are, um, are willing to be followed over time uh, see this as a way to track and, and monitor COVID-19 in the community and, um, and, and know when there is a new um, outbreak that, that could be addressed. At the same time, um, we're hoping to increase access uh, for people in the communities to testing. The uh, overall study, since, since we're looking at both uh, viral, uh, viral PCR and antibody together, we hope to understand both the immunity and risk of infection, and um, are really excited about this platform for large-scale at-home testing and surveillance of COVID-19 and potentially res other respiratory viruses as they roll in. The nice thing about this study um, is that it has an adaptive design. We're able to, for example, if um, you know, Mayor Walsh said uh, our mayor, the mayor of Boston, wants to increase um, testing for, I um, mean, recommended that people are, uh, get tested every two weeks. Um, we can have a, um, a larger partnership with the Boston Public Health Commission, for example, to um, to um, and enroll um, specific people if they needed to be enrolled. And then um, also has the ability to uh, incorporate new rapid diagnostics as they become available. We fully recognize that what, what's happening right now with a kit that gets sent out over 24 hours and then another 24 hours for a, a sample to be returned is still really not the ideal. You know, ideally what happens is people have access to a rapid, almost pregnancy test um, that could be done on a nasal swab with an answer immediately, but connected to healthcare and connected to public health. Um, so in summary, there remains an urgent need to increase access to testing for both symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals. This really needs to be linked to public health and healthcare efforts, including contact tracing, testing, and monitoring. Otherwise, there's really just no way that we're going to, um, to, to get on top of this. I, I, I feel like saying flattening the curve at this point um, is really, um, it's, it's, it's a bit of a misnomer. Um, unless we can get on top of flattening the curve and doing the contact tracing and test and testing and monitoring and really trying to um, slow the, the pandemic, we're, we're going to end up back where um, we were in the spring in many places. I would also say there needs, needs to be linkage to care um, so that we're as much as possible um, getting people in earlier. Um, and trying to limit some of the late severe presentations. We have made some progress with regards to treatment, um, but even the treatments we have available um, are still not as good as they need to be for folks coming in late to care. And then I will just say that home-based testing may be one solution to incorporate um, or to, and to achieve this uh, and so to incorporate into um, responses. So with that, I will stop and take questions. It's a fantastic talk. We really appreciate for this amazing talk. And the floor is open for question. I'm reading from Q&A. And the first question from Solomon, is there an interest in continuous monitoring other, mon other monitoring strategies? By other monitoring strategies, um, do you mean in testing or other? No, in continuous monitoring. And this is for real-time testing detection of COVID. Is there any interest on this? So as in, I'm trying to think, almost physiologic monitoring, but for virus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm reading the question. So uh, I think the virus, I will call COVID-19 virus. So what I would say is that, um, I think there is absolutely a need for more monitoring. I'm not sure I understand. Okay. Please, I the, Solomon is working on the technology for real-time COVID detection. I guess the question is related to real-time monitoring, real-time detection. Yeah, of so I think so, absolutely. And I think that's, that's what's going to potentially get us out of this before we have a vaccine, is if we can 
<clears throat> if I could swab my nose right now and know I had the virus right now, and then that keeps me at home, absolutely. I think that's that there's a huge need for it. I mean, I think where um, where we need to be considerate is the strategy around that. Because I think we can't rely, it, it has to be a combination, it has to be public working with um, public health. So if you have um, people with access to tests, somehow that has to be linked to. If I get tested and <clears throat> I know that um, I'm gonna stay home or I'm positive, I don't necessarily, the public health can't count on me to go do all the contact tracing for everyone I've been in contact for the last you know, seven days. So there needs to be some the, the rapid testing um, in con in conjunction with the contact tracing and the public health efforts. Okay. I will read one more question if you don't mind. And from Mark, uh, how much testing is needed to get on top of the pandemic? Yeah, it's a good I, question. I will, good question. I will request the brief answer. Thank yeah, you. Okay. fine. Um, you know, the bottom line is a lot. If you look at the countries that have done um, the best with this and are now, I mean, Vietnam is walking around without masks. They're not masking. Um, they, um, they test, they contact trace, they test all of the second degree contacts and all the third degree contacts. Um, so they're, and then they're, and they're monitoring folks. So it's the, it's, so it's a lot of testing and it's a lot of contact tracing. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate wonderful talk and the look forward to being in touch again. Thank Thanks. you. Okay. It's the, our next uh, distinguished speaker, panel speaker, Dr. John Torres, and he is currently the director of the Digital Psychiatry Division in the Department of Psychiatry at Beth Israel Medical Center at Harvard Medical School, affiliated teaching hospital, where he also serves as a staff psychiatrist and assistant professor. Uh, he's, he's active in investigating the potential of mobile mental health technologies for psychiatry, and he published uh, more than 200 peer-reviewed articles. It's a great honor and pleasure having you, Dr. Toros. Thank you all for having me, and I'm excited to talk about mental health and technology in the context of COVID. So, I'll jump right in. I have a unique background in that I did electrical engineering at UC Berkeley and was chair of the IEEE student branch. You can see this article from 2000, I think in seven. I still work as a practicing psychiatrist now. I went through medical school. Psychiatry we'll talk about is going virtual for telehealth, but sometimes you'll find me in the hospital seeing patients still. And a couple, about two years ago, there was an article we did in IEEE Spectrum that's very relevant today. This is the cover of IEEE Spectrum that was saying the smartphone will see you now. So the perspective I'll be talking to you is from electrical engineering, computer science, and psychiatry, and now looking at you know, what is the hybrid of these areas and how they can come together. So in psychiatry and psychology terms, there's something called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The details of it are not important. But I think what we've seen is that this is a very mental health specific concept. It really has been adapted now for a long time after to include Wi-Fi and battery life. Things that, again, sometimes were not as important before thinking about mental health now have become extremely important. So we're going to cover a lot of ground in 25 minutes. We're going to talk about quickly COVID and mental health, why smartphones and mental health are one part of the mental health solution. What is this idea of digital phenotyping? How can we bring this to clinical care? And what is going on in the world of app evaluation? And what are all the products out there that people are looking at? So I think the cartoon really gives a good representation. A lot of this intersection of technology and mental health is very nascent, it's evolving. And I think you'll see throughout my talk, there's a lot of help this research area at the intersection of fields needs from people with the expertise that are IEEE members. It's, there's a lot of opportunities for fantastic synergy. This is some of the newest data that just got published in Lancet this week. It was saying a diagnosis of COVID-19 was associated with the increased incidence of a first psychiatric diagnosis. About two times was the hazard ratio 
So if you basically get COVID, you're two times likely to get first onset of a new mental illness. Anxiety was the highest in depression. What's also interesting, it kind of goes both ways. A psychiatric diagnosis in the previous year was associated with a higher incidence of COVID-19. So what we're seeing kind of COVID and mental health are linked, they're each influencing each other. We're learning more about what are the neuropsychiatric sequela of COVID-19. I think we don't have enough data to really understand exactly what's happening, but clearly this virus is going to the brain and we are going to be seeing some brain differences. And this paper does a very good job you can see a citation there from this week of really outlining potentially what's happening and that it's not some of the common causes that we think. I think we may remember in the summer, we saw it at the CDC, this was a, put out a report saying that kind of mental health rates of diagnosis were rising among people. It's especially noticed in minority communities, Blacks and Latinos, especially young people as well. And these are some of the highest rates of mental illness I think we've seen on recent records. So I think we realize that there's a lot happening in the mental health space and there's a need for more effort. Classically, we know that one in four people experience some type of mental illness in their lifetime. We also have known for a long time that we don't have enough clinicians and treaters. This looks at everything from counselors, social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, nurse practitioners. We, we don't have enough providers and we're not making enough. And I think that's where clearly what this IEEE Spectrum article kind of found in 2017 that I wrote was saying, there's potential that technology could be used to augment and extend mental health care. That if we don't have enough providers, we may certainly have enough access to technology. And that's what we'll focus this talk on. I think we do have to look in terms of disparities. We know not everyone has access to technology and the right internet to do video visits and telehealth. This is a year old data from Pew, but it really shows us who's not online. It is some of the most vulnerable patients, people in rural areas, less educated, less income, minorities, older adults. But on the left panel, at least we can see that we are making progress in connecting everyone, but worth keeping in mind. There's a lot of devices and technology and innovation that can have a large impact in mental health. And what I wanted to show on this slide is there's really exciting research happening all over the spectrum. There's actually a video game that received AD FDA approval for ADHD in the last year. So I'll focus more on smartphones as that's what my research group does more of. And I think it's applicable because most of us have them and can use them. Some quick terminology, active data is a a very simple way of saying we can get smartphone surveys from people. We can kind of look at people's individual trajectories of mental illness and what they experience. And this is older work we've done, but you can really actually get a pretty interesting profile of how people are experiencing, in this case, depression. And the point being is we really can capture fire, finer grain resolution data. Where it becomes interesting, and this is from that IEEE Spectrum article, is our smartphones are collecting many types of what we call passive data where you don't have to actively engage with your smartphone to know where you are. If you've turned on GPS, if you've turned on accelerometer or gyroscope, if you've turned on different types of light sensors. So this passive data may in part be a proxy for behavior. We may be able to learn about different aspects. In part, we're seeing contact tracing apps are beginning to use some of these to learn about kind of exposure to people with COVID or COVID hotspots, we could also learn about, again, people's sleep, right? We could learn about people's mood, people's activities. And this is just a screenshot you can really generate with active and passive data. A lot of interesting features, a lot of interesting correlations between people's experience of mental health and kind of behaviors that may be picked up by the smartphone. The smartphones are also interesting because we can deliver mental health intervention. We're not going to we can, of course, do video visits, which is exciting. Our field has some limitations. We also can do better without a physical exam or touching a patient in most fields. We can also push kind of different exercises, tips, clinical visits from the smartphone. So in some ways, you really can have a closed loop system where we gather information from surveys, sensors in real time, respond in real time with smartphones. So. This kind of brings up the concept of digital phenotyping that classically a lot of mental illness, it's been hard to characterize how people are doing. What is the mental health response to COVID? We can gather a lot more than 
surveys, right? We can really gather kind of the contextual information, behavioral information, the environmental information, the proxies that go with this. And there, there's many ways you could call this smartphone sensing, you could call it social sensing, you could call it digital phenotyping. But it's a very powerful concept for mental health that really helps us understand, especially as we're doing more and more video visits, not seeing patients, really how people are experiencing mental illness on an individual basis and what is the objective evidence-based data that is kind of underlying their experience. How do we get something like sleep from smartphone sensors? If I think any of us who have tried to make sleep algorithms from high quality wearables from smartphones know, it certainly can be challenging, right? We're kind of looking at device motion, we're using different filters, we're trying to figure out kind of periods of high and low activity and trying to infer sleep. We know in this type of work, people bring their own smartphones, they each have different chipsets, they have different operating systems running, people have different characteristics of using the phone. Some people may not move the phone at all, so an algorithm like this won't really detect sleep. We have periods where you can see here of missing this, but you can begin to see on a high resolution level, we could learn about behaviors like sleep for some people. We've also learned some of our patients share phones, some of our patients rent phones, some of our patients don't have phones. So this won't work for everyone, but we can certainly begin to get this. And we have done a lot of research giving out wearables to patients. The problem is they don't always keep wearing the wearables after a couple of days. Some people do, but the more we can get from the smartphone, the easier. We can do this. So what the data looks like for us as clinicians or researchers is we can turn GPS features into kind of a daily column. Here's a heat map of kind of circadian routine, home time, distance traveled. We can get anonymized call and text logs from some phones. We don't know who people called or what they said, just how many incoming and outgoing calls. So perhaps if you knew that me, John, made a thousand phone calls and got none back, that could give you some information about kind of my social status or that no one wants to talk to me. And for different patients, it can look different. So you can almost see we're beginning to get a digital fingerprint, perhaps, of behavior that could be related to mental health as picked up by the smartphone. We've used this, and what we're using it now is to look at relapse and serious mental illnesses like bipolar or schizophrenia or depression. We can use an algorithm called anomaly detection and set a baseline for each person because how people's mobility patterns is picked up by the smartphone, their sociability, their self-reported outcomes, are going to vary. So we can basically bootstrap a baseline and understand kind of what would be across the threshold for an anomaly. And then each day kind of compare people's daily mobility, sociability to understand did they cross that bootstrap baseline? And are they at higher risk of something being different? In this case, the red arrow represents relapse and we've been kind of to scale this up as I'll show you to use technology to really understand when someone may get elevated risk of relapse. You can see what's interesting is we had the self-reported surveys were elevated, but also the smartphone was automatically the passive data picking up the mobility and sociability differences. So what we've done is we've made an open source project. Everything's on GitHub. It's with a open source license. And we've kind of expanded this to keep us, we can assess a lot of information from sensors and surveys. But in kind of working with our patients, they want information back. They want to see their data. They want basic things to manage their conditions. They, they want to have access to journals, medication trackers, mindfulness, different, and they want health information. So we've built this platform called LAMP, which is Learn, Assess, Manage, Prevent. And again, it's an open source collaborative project, really with teams across the world using it. These are some different teams from Mayo Clinic, from teams at Ninhans and National Institute of Mental Health. Bangalore, to teams at the Shanghai Mental Health Center in China, to University of Ottawa, and more. And you can, I'll put our website link at the end, you can kind of see our code and what different people are doing, kind of be able to collect this type of mental health data. And there's different things you can do clinically, even just showing patients their own mental health data can sometimes help build emotional self-awareness. If you think about it, a lot of mental health data is collected via surveys, in a lot of those surveys, when we collect them, we just get the answers. Now we can do things like cognitive tests or tap tests of attention and memory. And you can see we can begin to look at the process of how people take the tests and to understand it's not just what your scores or how quickly you do it, but how quickly do you error correct. 
What is your improvement over time? So there really is new longitudinal data we can bring into mental health. I show you guys this risk prediction algorithm that we're using, and now we can scale it up to look at whole panels of patients. So we can begin to look at our patients who right now we can't see face-to-face -face during COVID, we can see during three of video visits, of course, but it's exciting to kind of be able to check in with them and kind of have some preventative warning signs and be able to kind of personalize what we may be looking for. So we can really better hotspot patients who may be at risk. We can also begin to answer new questions in mental health that we've never been able to really look at before. I think we all know intuitively that green space and kind of exposure to nature outdoors is beneficial, it's healthy, it's something that generally does people well. And it's possible to quantify green space by a measure called NDVI on ArcGIS, various mapping softwares. Higher NDVI measure means higher green space. That's the map of Massachusetts. You can see Boston is more urban, there's less green space. So what we're able to, again, only on a correlational basis is, with people's permission, get their GPS and say, if people who have high exposure, so great NB NDVI, they had a lower correlation with mental health severity. And again, correlation does not mean causation, but it's interesting to be able to begin to pick up these, these new metrics that can really help us get a more holistic picture of people's mental health, how they're doing, and what could be beneficial. Oftentimes, just presenting correlation matrices to people in our clinic or to patients can be very helpful in letting them interpret it. We're beginning to move this into global mental health. Even during COVID, we're now doing projects in India where the paradigm, I think, makes sense in three steps. We can understand people's condition through some of the passive and active smartphone data, run different algorithms, and only detection is one of several, understand people may be at risk, but begin to push them nudges, information, help from the smartphone to can kind of work towards increasing access to mental health resources. This isn't a replacement for a video visit or a telehealth visit or inpatient care, but certainly it could be useful for especially people that have no access right now, and it could actually help us again move towards prevention. One thing that's not technical that we've learned to do in this work is while well, a lot of people may have smartphones, I'm sure on Black Friday it'll be even cheaper to get at Walmart. Sometimes a lot of people we work with may not have the digital health literacy skills to use smartphones. They may not actually know basic things like how to connect to Wi-Fi, how to connect to weather, how to check their steps. So we've been running digital health literacy groups. We're about to launch them online. And I think that building kind of digital health literacy is important for really helping people access so much health care during COVID, not just mental health. And it's surprising how many people you may know that have phones, but again, may not know how to use them towards health. We have a teaching manual on our website. Our website should be updated in a couple of weeks with kind of a whole online suite of resources. But I put that out, out there in case anyone is interested or wants to look at new things. We've also learned that we have to add new healthcare team members in. I'll talk about our clinical efforts. And what we've seen is kind of bringing this technology into the clinic, working in busy settings, not just research studies, is sometimes in fields like radiology, we have a radiology tech or pathology of a pathology tech. We kind of need a mental health tech to really help translate and help with the workflow issues that come along with bringing new technology into the mental health visit. So in our case, we use a digital navigator to kind of fulfill some of those roles. So we actually do run a clinic where we see people now, of course, via telehealth and video visits. And we also kind of ask them to use the smartphone app, as you can see here, to collect physical activity, environmental stressors, real-time surveys, cognitive testing. We can run algorithms in real time. We can have this digital navigator, new team member, working with us to really make a personalized care plan. But the idea isn't to put the technology between the clinician and the patient in these mental health visits. It's really to kind of augment and extend and bring new information that helps both parties make an informed decision and drive care. And I think that's a very important paradigm in all of mental health. It, we've seen a lot of research, I won't go into all of it, but giving people an app and saying, use it for self-help hasn't really changed anything. We've had almost a decade of kind of self-help apps that haven't really transformed anything. But this paradigm of using the technology to extend and augment care, I think, can work well. So I won't go into detail of the protocol, but I want to wrap up and talk quickly about this world of smartphone app evaluation. 
a lot of people are typing in depression, anxiety, stress into the iTunes or the Google Play Store and coming up with a lot of apps. We've tried to guesstimate how many mental health related apps are out there. It's hard to do. Our guess was in the range of 10,000, but that was an old estimate. In my favorite analogy, it's like cargo ship containers. You can't really look at all of them because they've all changed and updated and moved on by the time that you have. The FDA actually gives very little guidance for psychiatric technology. This came out in April 2020. They, the FDA basically said, look, this is a complex space. We're not sure what the harms are. The benefits don't seem to be, the harms don't seem to be huge. The benefits we're still learning about. So the FDA kind of said, we're going to take a hands-off approach to this. And what we've seen from much older research, many terrific groups, is that app store ratings and indexing indexing apps or the top apps, the most downloaded apps, the five-star apps, it doesn't really tell you anything about the clinical utility or benefit of an app. And I think if you think intuitively in healthcare, it makes sense. We don't have an A-plus medication. We don't have an, a four-star diabetes medicine versus five-star diabetes medicine. And we also know apps are updating constantly. So what version was even rated on these lists? With the American Psychiatric Association, we've made this framework. It's actually very general. It applies outside psychiatric illnesses. It applies for really anything. I'm just thinking, what are the unique risks and benefits of digital mental health technologies? What is the ease of use? And can data be shared? And I want to quickly take you through all four layers. If you want to learn more, you can just Google American Psychiatric Association framework. For security and privacy, a lot of these mental health apps have a lot of security flaws. This was an article from earlier in 2020, but it's funny, a security researcher said he was forced to take down a blog post describing a parent bug in Talkspace's website. He got a cease and desist letter. So there's really not a transparency in kind of helping find security flaws. But I think the bigger issue, this was a New York Times article, really saying, look, when you actually look at these mental health apps, they're not really being built to protect people's mental health and their privacy is not always respected. We did a study last year, we did a man in the middle attack on popular mental health apps for smoking cessation depression, the citations in the bottom. But I think the headline gives you some idea that a lot of these apps aren't really respecting their own privacy policies and there's a lot of data floating around where it shouldn't be. We actually ended up presenting this to the Federal Trade Commission because it wasn't an FDA issue, it was more a marketing issue. If the app says your information is private and protected, but it's not. In the US at least, that goes to the FTC, creating different countries that will happen. So there's also a lot of claims that are sometimes exaggerated. We've looked at kind of what the app stores will tell you or patients. A lot of them, 64% will make some of these strong claims and very few can back up that evidence. The reason that happens in mental health is people say, well, this is inspired by evidence-based therapy, but they're not really saying, well, does evidence-based therapy actually work in a smartphone? In some cases, yes. In some cases, no. This was just an interesting summary article of a popular app in the US called Headspace that has perhaps more interest in talk than it has evidence. So we quickly talk about risk, we talk about evidence. This was a fascinating paper really getting to the human computer interaction space of looking that most people who download mental health apps, about 90% stop using them after about 10 days. They're really not engaging on their own. And there's a huge need for kind of better design and human-centered research on what will make these things useful. And the last part is we certainly actually need a lot of work on, we have a lot of technical standards like HL7, we have standards like Smart and Fire, which may make sense to some of you listening, but we really don't want mental health data to be siloed in each app or program. We really want there to be better interoperability so that data can lead to a discussion. So I'll conclude in saying, we've turned a lot of these kind of abstract principles I just talked to you about risk, evidence, ease of use, and what we did is we've actually codified them into questions that we think are more binary and codable, and we've put them onto a website where you can search about 250 apps. Our UI UX is being updated. It doesn't quite look like this. These are our figmas. But you can go to this website and take a look at what are different mental health apps, what features they have. So on that, I'll end and say thank you all. Thank you so much for this great talk, Dr. Toros. We have several questions. I will start with our former president of EMBS, uh, Dr. Christian Rule, and he was asking that is the, your data is more US centric and would you like to comment also uh, for any other data and the uh, outside the United States? 
Yeah, so I think what we've seen, again, because we share everything openly, we have teams collecting similar data. I don't have, I'm not gonna share other teams' data, but from talking to other teams collecting this, I think they've seen very similar things in what the smartphones can do in terms of what data they collect. We're seeing similar patterns actually being collected from India to Canada to Australia. So, so I think it's the beauty of this is that we can get it right and collaborate. We can really do global collaborations easily. Another question from Professor Mihalis Zervakis from the Cree. And he is asking, is there any attempt to increase specificity of the test with the environmental and lifestyle factors or any other the phenotypical signs? Yeah, so as we begin to look at more sensors that we can gather, generally what we're seeing is we can, our sensitivity can be high in detecting relapse if our specificity is lower. So I think one area of ongoing research and collaboration is, is we can get higher quality signals that may be proxies for behavior. That will certainly increase our specificity. We didn't talk about the ethics and certainly we have to make sure people are comfortable sharing this data and we can guarantee that it's private and secure. So in part, we also run up against making sure we have enough trust to collect this data and use it. But I think more sensors that are high quality will definitely increase the specificity of our predictions. Okay. This is this question from the society presidents, uh, from uh, Dr. Shankar Subramian and myself. And this is a great work, great apps you presented. How can we use these technologies uh, for tracing, screening of COVID-19 patients? Since the form is really focused on COVID-19, uh, I know many people, I mean, we are at, all at home, many of us work from home, and the, we are stressed out. I think the mental uh, the issues will be very prominent next couple of months as well. So could you please comment that how you can link into the COVID-19? Yeah, so I think, I think as you, we're going to see kind of more and more mental health presentations. No one quite knows what the trajectory will be. I think what we really have to begin doing, though, is because we can now assess mental health on this more granular level and we can assess it longitudinally, we need to really learn about what are the mental health sequelae of COVID. For people who get COVID or are exposed to it, what is the increased risk? What are we looking for? What are the early signs of different mental health changes? Mm -hmm. And right now we don't know that. We have even that Lancet study I started with about COVID really are just these kind of giant medical record databases. We're looking at populations. So we're not able to yet kind of make individual inferences or predictions about how COVID will impact mental health and who could be at risk. And I think if we deploy these personalized approaches using people's smartphones, we can begin to monitor mental health on a personal basis in the home today. Please. One more question from Nguyen. Is the data set that you collect in your lab to be publicly available? So what we're, we're talking right now, no, because we're turning the GPS into features. If we give out the GPS, that, that would be, again, identifiable. What we're doing is trying to basically figure out, can we make a data set that's not identifiable and doesn't kind of then violate US privacy laws called HIPAA? The other part I'd say is because we give our app, it's completely open source and free. It's very easy for you to collect your own data set. There's no barriers, there's no cost. We have a lot of documentation online how to do it. So you can actually do this fairly easily yourself and begin collecting the data. Okay, the final question from Murat Demirer. Do we have any possibility to incorporate EEG into digital psychology? Yes, yeah, so I actually used to do, when I was at UC Berkeley as an undergraduate, I actually used to do a lot of EEG research, and in part it was the frustration of trying to find a signal in EEG that drove me towards other areas. But I think that certainly there are increasingly wearable EEGs and there's dry electrodes that could be a very interesting signal to add to this digital smartphone work. We haven't explored that yet, but I think that's a huge area of growth and potential to do it in a evidence-based, logical, smart way. So thank you guys. Thank you. We appreciate the talk. Uh, we look forward to being in touch with you again. Thank you so much, you. Dr. Torres. Thank you. And our next the keynote, uh, the plenary speaker, Dr. Twitter, Michael Twitter. He is, let me check them if we have any.
Okay, Michael is on. So is the uh, neuromusculoskeletal diagnostic and interventional radiologist and with the uh, extensive experience in image guided perisocanius needle biopsy of the bone and soft lesions. And his role is to help review the PET, CT, other imaging modalities of the patient in the study and to confirm the lesion can be biopsied and address the purpose of study. So he also performed the targeted image guiding bone biopsies and delivered samples for histopathological analysis. Dr. Tuti. All right, thank you, Metin. Um, need to go ahead and, there we go. Uh, so I am a uh, musculoskeletal radiologist uh, doing diagnostic and interventional radiology, um, but I also spent half my time as the vice chair of the operations for our radiology department. And uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is some of the operational challenges um, in a radiology department due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So to kind of give you an overview of what we saw, um, this was our uh, weekday volume data. It's actually work RVU uh, data, which uh, work RVUs is sort of uh, at each sort of imaging thing or interventional imaging guided intervention you do has a, a work RVU. And so a MRI scan might be worth 10 times a chest X-ray for instance. Uh, but this was our work RVU data, and you can see around uh, mid-March, we had a uh, precipitous drop in our work RVUs, dropped to about a third of what we normally uh, did. And it stayed that way for about a month and then gradually increased that one blip there uh, was at the end of the May. So that was the U.S. Memorial Day holiday. So this was uh, weekend data, and uh, you can see how we recovered. Um, and so the reason we did the initial drop was there was, uh, you know, the uh, increasing surge was occurring in uh, several parts of the United States, not where uh, we uh, work in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, but the biggest fear we had was that we were going to have a surge of patients that were going to require to be admitted to the hospital, like was the way we're starting to see in New York City, for instance, and we wouldn't have bed availability. And so we basically tried to, to st stop all non-emergent, non-urgent imaging and interventional procedures um, so that we had, um, we weren't going to have to admit patients after some of these procedures, number one. And number two, we would have uh, uh, the ability to reassign x-ray techs to do other roles in the department if needed, in addition to potentially having to do uh, imaging of uh, patients with COVID. So increased bed availability. The other th the reason we, uh, the hospital sort of pulled back on doing a lot of things was safety for both the staff and other patients that were coming in maybe to have an MRI scan, for instance, for their uh, headaches or spine pain or something, um, but didn't have COVID, we didn't want people to be exposed to patients that had COVID. And then, like I mentioned, it was uh, the hospital really felt they, they wanted to have all hands on deck to potentially reassign staff to assist in other areas in the hospital. After we were, um, you know, fairly reduced volume for about a month there, we started to resume imaging. And we did that for two big reasons. One was we had been postponing other patient care, um, including cancer patients, for instance, and we really needed to sort of get back to um, doing the imaging or image guided intervention for those patients um, uh, to get them back into the sort of the more routine. And then a second big thing in the United States was just hospital revenue, um, you know, radiology, uh, provides a lot of revenue for the department with all the MRI scans and CAT scans uh, that we do, just like a lot of other services in the hospital. And we had, you know, a lot of doctors and staff, because the surge never uh, got as bad as we had predicted, who were, you know, basically at home um, and not working. And uh, we worried about the fact that we'd be, be able to provide care long-term for patients um, if we didn't get back to start doing uh, a lot of the MRs and CT scans, for instance, within radiology. And so we should, in a safe way, we started to resume uh, doing, uh, doing a lot of our uh, non-emergent care um, for the department. Another thing, going back to the beginning of 
uh, the pandemic um, was that in March, we were getting the word from some radiology departments in New York City that they had a higher COVID rate in two groups of their technologists, the ultrasound sonographers and the mammography uh, technologists compared to other radiology personnel. Um, and in New York City, it turns out, you know, a lot of these uh, technologists who were working in hospitals in Manhattan um, were taking the subway. So they were on a crowded subway, you know, in March before we understood a lot about COVID coming in to, uh, to work. And there was no difference really in terms of, you know, exposures by uh, ultrasound sonographers or mammography technologists to other people, you know, within non-masked and stuff. Um, but they had a higher rate of COVID in their department. And we assumed it was because of increased physical contact. The mammographers, like and you can see in this uh, 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 photo here, you know, have to uh, hug close to the patient while they position them for a mammogram. Ultrasound sonographers, you know, have the probe that they hold in their hand and they're right next to the patient for, you know, often 15, 20 minutes uh, doing some sort of doing scanning. So that was sort of in line with what we were hearing from other uh, healthcare uh, you know, services and agencies was that, you know, physical contact uh, is uh, that the COVID virus spreads um, on surfaces. And so we responded really by doing lots of surface cleaning in our department, uh, including, you know, in, when we had patients who might have had uh, that, that were under investigation to see if they had COVID, they might have had respiratory symptoms and stuff. And so we were doing lots of surface cleaning. But at that point, masks were considered optional in the U.S., you know, even though they were prevalent to being used in other places that had experience with SARS and stuff um, in the U.S. that we weren't uh, actually having masks being required. What we did do uh, is we reduced, you know, obviously the radiology staff in the hospital at the beginning of this pandemic. Um, so we had lots of technologists who were being reassigned or doing nothing um, because we had stopped doing these routine and screening exams. The non-interventional radiologists, we shifted to uh, working at home. Uh, so PAX is the picture archiving uh, system that we use to uh, read all our digital images. Uh, we were fortunate in our um, department that we had outfitted almost all the radiologists with home packs um, as we um, started to provide sort of better, faster overread of our residents, our radiology residents and training who are the ones who work overnight. Um, we, uh, uh, to provide better service for that, we had home packs so we could uh, go home at the end of the day, but then go on and log on and work until uh, um, till nine or 10 o'clock at night, checking their reads uh, and making sure that they, uh, that they had an accurate read. Uh, for the clinicians in the emergency room, et cetera. Um, so we switched to uh, reading from home. And so we had stopped doing a lot of interventional procedures and and uh, and, pretty, and most of the radiologists were able to, to uh, read uh, the uh, imaging at home. Um, the radiologists who did come into the hospital, because there are some radiologists that have to be here to check ultrasounds and potentially go in and, and do the scanning themselves to do some of the uh, procedures that were needed. For instance, as a musculoskeletal radiologist, we still had patients who, um, you know, might have had a possibly infected hip or infected knee joint that, uh, that we would have to tap. So what we did was we uh, uh, worked in, uh, by setting up cohorts. And so instead of you rotating uh, to working in the main hospital and then to an outpatient MRI center and, and that sort of thing, we had people going to a single site so that they were uh, cleaning a one workstation, which was the only one they worked at, um, rather than going to the, uh, to the various places that you would typically uh, go to, which we like because it gives you variety when you get to work in, uh, you know, at different places uh, from day to day. Um, and at that time, you know, we spent, like I said, a lot of time cleaning uh, your workspace, because that was what we thought was the main uh, transmission route. Uh, we still, even though we, we uh, you know, had medical students and some of our residents that we uh, had stay, uh, stay home and early when we didn't know how bad the surge was, was going to get, we still had to have fellows in the, uh, in the reading room with us. Um, you know, they're sort of vital for us to be able to uh, take care of the patients and do the volume that we do. Um, and so we switched to teaching remotely from across the room as opposed to pulling up our chairs side by side. 
uh, uh, next to the uh, uh, next to the fellow, for instance, um, and taking the mouse uh, and pointing to things on the packs as you review the images and discuss the findings with them. Um, one of the things that we did also was that we had a uh, uh, we started to get much better at using screen sharing software, um, which had been available technologically, but we've just fairly uh, rarely used it. Um, but now you could actually have, uh, you know, sort of a trainee that you would go over cases with being in a, a separate room and you could uh, use the screen sharing software so that I could control the mouse, they could actually control the same mouse um, and we could point and discuss things. And so we did a lot of um, staffing out both in the room using screen sharing software so that we uh, maintain a distance from each other, but also uh, in two separate rooms, we could staff out over the, uh, over the phones. Um, and for hands-on patient care, uh, you know, we just used gloves and frequent hand washing, including uh, if you kept your gloves on, we were, you know, using alcohol gel on the gloves uh, after we touched the patient or we, or we just scratched our face. Um, and the, uh, and this is, you know, non-sterile gloves when we're not doing a sterile procedure. And then we started adding, you know, that instead of having a mask be optional for some patient interactions, we started wearing a mask um, all the time as, as sort of the data was changing and showing the, uh, the benefit that wearing a mask has. The problem that uh, when we started uh, wearing masks more and more was that uh, it's kind of embarrassing that uh, you could start running out of masks at a hospital again, <laughs> showing just how often we weren't probably, you know, wearing masks uh, with some of our interactions with, with patients where, you know, we, if we had the flu or uh, early cold or something, we could have been spreading it. Um, but we started running out of personal protective equipment, particularly face masks. And so the first thing we started doing was reusing the mask for multiple patients, as opposed to in the US where we would discard the, the mask you know, between every patient uh, so that you didn't carry any kind of bacteria or virus from patient to patient. Um, and uh, uh, so we were starting to uh, reuse the mask and, um, um, and also, except when, you know, obviously you would, you would uh, discard the mask if you had a COVID positive patient, and then you were going to a non COVID positive patient. Um, and then we started to uh, realize we needed to use face shields, both to, to uh, protect our eyes, but also to protect the masks from any kind of direct splatter since we were going um, from patient to patient. And face shields were cheaper and easier than discarding masks because we had such a shortage of uh, a shortage of masks at the time. Um, so currently, um, we you know the supply has picked up in the United States, and so for our regular sort of face masks, the rule of thumb is that you try to use it for three shifts, three eight hour shifts, and for the more expensive. Uh, and harder to get N95 masks that you would use for somebody who's COVID, COVID positive or suspected COVID positive, uh, you would try to use that for uh, seven shifts. So we realized that face masks would help, but quickly the supply of commercial face masks uh, was worn out. So one of the earliest things that our engineering department did was be able to say, hey, we can make face shields that you can use. And so uh, this was, uh, here's a little uh, plastic uh, Bucky Badger, who's the mascot for the sports teams at the University of Wisconsin, where I work, um, that the uh, engineering department said, you know what, we have, you know, thin, clear plastic, foam and stuff. It's easy to put together a mask. You can see this has just staples in it right here. And this was very important for us to survive sort of that, uh, you know, that period early on. Uh, and even as we started ramping up was that we had this very large, uh, easy supply of face masks um, or that uh, our face shields, I'm sorry, face shields, plastic clear face shields that we had that allowed us to save our N95 and our surgical masks uh, and reuse them uh, and be able to do a lot of the sort of resumption of services that we were, that we were able to do. Um, and they're uh, very clever, the engineering people, they had uh, uh, some patients where we uh, did not want to wear 
a face mask under the face shield. And so they devised this thing, they called it the Bucky Shield. So Bucky is the name of the mascot, um, where it has this sort of cloth uh, thing that's draped underneath the chin. Um, so if you had a patient who was deaf, for instance, and needed to uh, read lips, uh, you could use this. Uh, sometimes, you know, with children or some people, that are mentally ill, that are frightened by somebody coming in with a face mask, uh, they could put this on and it was a uh, safe way to protect both uh, themselves and the, the, the provider, medical provider and the patient um, by, by wearing that. So uh, some neat innovation from our engineering team. Uh, there are other, you know, supplies. We talked about, you know, the cleaning of the of the keyboards and our mice and everything that we use when we're reading our images digitally on a Mac, uh, on a on a PAC system. We were running out of those, and so our pharmacy services, for instance, uh, came up with, you know, something that was at least seventy percent. Um, alcohol for hand sanitizer and that was a huge thing that allowed us again to expand the amount of services we did and and, uh, and provide enough hand sanitizer for us to even run our regular hospital operations um, and the same thing even with cleaning supplies uh, the wipes were in short supply uh, hospitals were trying to, to get more and more of them as they were uh, burning through them much quicker and uh, and we've had our uh, our internal hospital been able to uh, put together bottles of cleaning supplies and stuff for us to use so that we could uh, feel like we were safe uh, in cleaning our areas. So what about the radiology imaging just overall on their operations? So it turned out that um, uh, many patients who have COVID end up not getting any imaging at all. They have mild symptoms, not enough of, uh, to, for the, somebody to even get a chest x-ray, particularly when they're, when they're in the outpatient setting. Um, and the most patients who are sick enough with COVID, with uh, respiratory symptoms that they come to the emergency room, will get a chest x-ray, but that's all the imaging they get. So we were very worried about shut, when we shut everything down was we have to handle this influx of imaging that really didn't uh, materialize. So that was one lesson that we learned. Uh, we looked at, uh, after a couple of months, we looked at our inpatients. So these are sick enough that not only did they come to the emergency room, but they had to be admitted. Uh, they averaged only one chest x-ray for every four days of their stay. Um, and uh, so that was partly, you know, people utilizing chest x-rays really only when needed. If there was a change in their, uh, um, in their symptoms and they were deteriorating, they might get a new chest x-ray, but it not to be, it wasn't needed as much as we thought. Other radiology imaging was very uncommon for inpatients, only about one per week. And some of those were just abdominal x-rays for people that had abdominal pain. Uh, there's been a lot written uh, in the radiology literature on doing CT scans of the chest, um, and uh, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not the sort of you know pathognomonic uh, CT scan that can allow you to make the diagnosis. It's it's getting better, um, but there's still overlap with other viral pneumonias, um, and uh, um, and so we were we're still really using it only as a problem solver where we need to get a better view of what's going on in the chest than, uh, than just the chest x-ray. Uh, we we're also uh, fortunate that uh, the x-rays, especially chest x-rays, but even other x-rays and ultrasound, we could do those portably and not bring the patient into the radiology department. I'll talk a little bit later about what the impact is that. So these are being done portable. And in fact, uh, we uh, quickly learned that we could shoot the chest, uh, the, the x-ray through the patient's door. So here's a glass door in an emergency room with an x-ray machine um, shining through the glass out of the patient. And that way, you know, the technologist would have to suit up to go into the room with a COVID positive patient to put the plate, the digital plate behind the patient's chest, for instance. Um, but we could keep the x-ray machine out in the hallway so it wasn't exposed directly to the patient. And that meant we didn't have to do, you know, sort of the uh, time-consuming cleaning of the actual x-ray machine. You just had to clean the digital plate uh, between patients. Uh, in fact, even with some of our inpatient doors, which, uh, which are wood, uh, if they had a glass window in them, you could, we were able to do things like this where we could take a, a x-ray just by lining the x-ray tube, uh, x-ray source, uh, shine it through the window uh, onto the plate that's behind the patient sitting in the... Uh, in the room. Uh, 
And uh, ultrasound is also another one that's that's nice because it can be done portally and some of these COVID positive patients are gonna you know, have abdominal symptoms and need an abdominal ultrasound, for instance. And so we were able to cover the, that piece of equipment completely with plastic, as you see on the right-hand image there, and, uh, and be able to take it in the, in the patient's room. And again, not have to try to swab down all of the buttons on the ultrasound machine um, and to sterilize it after after taking the ultrasound, but we can just remove the, uh, the plastic. So we did have CT, MRI, and interventional procedures which occur in the radiology department. So the, we were having COVID positive patients come into the uh, into the department itself and be in the room, um, and so that introduced a, a, a couple of concerns. Uh, First is that, you know, these radiology imaging rooms, you know, like a lot of rooms in the hospital where there's an intake vent in the ceiling, so they're basically slightly positive pressure and the, uh, you know, the flow is for air to return out, uh, you know, under the door uh, and, uh, you know, doors aren't sealed in, in most radiology uh, rooms um, and that's where the air return occurs. Uh, our interventional rooms usually had some sort of extra air filter uh, at the inflow. And in the hospital, it turns out that the rooms are variable. Um, some of the interventional rooms have higher air changes per hour. Some of, uh, some of our other basic diagnostic x-ray rooms have only about eight air changes to, uh, uh, per hour. And we do have increased uh, airflow to improve sterility. So if you've got a filter on the inflow and you've got higher uh, flow rate, it's a, it's a slightly positive pressure room, even with the crack under the door, but air is moving out of the, uh, out of the door. And so anybody who's a, doing a procedure who coughs a little bit, air is moving out of the door, you're not gonna infect the, uh, infect the patient. Um, while you're doing the procedures. Our outpatient imaging uh, has less airflow, unfortunately. So uh, the rule of thumb is about 10 to 20 air changes per hour, uh, or air changes should occur after you do an infected patient. So in our outpatient setting, you know, some of these times we have to uh, shut the room down for, you know, an hour or two hours uh, just to let the passive uh, uh, mild slight positive pressure move the, uh, uh, you know, any sort of infectious organisms out of the room. So that's sort of our, that's our baseline. The hospital quickly, um, you know, started realizing the value of negative pressure rooms uh, uh, to be able to take these patients. So we were using these for highly infectious patients. And you have, um, there's a couple things about a negative pressure room is that you have to have um, outflow from within the room that has to stay within the room because you don't want it to go out in the hallway and you've got a basically a fan that's blowing out uh, of the room and you need a HEPA filter um, or some sort of thing to sort of filter out on the outflow, uh, which is a classic sort of negative pressure room. Uh, some of these, you know, might have a dedicated intake uh, or inflow within the room. Otherwise, you know, you potentially could even, when you go in and out through the door, that's fine. It's a negative pressure room, even though you're bringing in air uh, from the hallway um, for this highly infectious patient, what you're worried about is the organisms uh, with the patient in the room and it's gonna, and it's gonna uh, get the flow out of the room and get trapped by a filter. Operating rooms in the hospital are, are sort of unique in, in the sense that they're positive pressure, but they have sealed doors and an in-room air return. And they have to have a HEPA filter on inflow because you don't want any, even just the air coming in through the vents, you don't you want that to be filtered because you have an open surgical uh, site. Some of these were converted to negative pressure, which was fairly easy because it was a closed system. They reversed the fan and they flipped the uh, HEPA filter direction on that. So the fan was now, instead of blowing in with positive pressure, was blowing out. Um, and they took the HEPA filter that they had and uh, and and just you know switched it as well. Um, so then they, and then you add a HEPA filter on inflow because again you got to be sterile during doing an OR procedure and so you have to have a high efficiency filter on the inflow. But that was uh, fairly straightforward for radiology. Unfortunately, we don't have sealed rooms, and so um, we did some where we would convert them to negative pressure, but we had to actually seal up the rooms uh, just using, like you can see, their plastic sheets with portable units um, because we didn't have the ability to reverse the fans. And so what we did was just let the uh, we just let the uh, air come passively in through the inflow. 
um, and then have a, uh, you know, hook up a, a, a portable uh, fan to sort of blow out. And that was the main thing driving the negative pressure. Um, and, uh, and, you know, obviously with the HEPA filter on that portable so that you can filter out the COVID organism. But it was very loud. And so this was a big sort of inconvenience thing. Um, we also started doing what was called a three minute clean in addition to those air changes, which is uh, the, the time that it's for a typical sort of room that size if you wipe everything down with bleach wipes. Uh, uh, and that became the standard for uh, what we did. So one of the operational things that happened for our department was it did take a little bit longer uh, to take care of uh, each of our patients. And there are UV lights and we did increase the number of purchases of those as it, as it became available because that allowed you to reduce the turnaround time because you wouldn't have to wait as long in between patients. Um, we did design some additional things, including this, which is the Bucky box, which has holes in it so that you could sort of have a self-contained area uh, around the patient. So they weren't just wearing a mask uh, or if they couldn't wear a mask, um, you could uh, do some procedures or, or talk to the patient, uh, yet have it uh, COVID potentially get contained better right next to the uh, patient. And then we sort of had a, a progressive response uh, as we've, uh, as we've, you know, been going uh, sort of at full volume here for a while, where we're just trying to keep track of our inpatient census and stuff and sort of having plans for what we're going to do if uh, the uh, uh, COVID surge gets worse. Thank you. Thank you so much for excellent talk, Dr. Judy. Any questions from the audience? I am going to check the uh, chat room. I don't see any. Okay, there's one question maybe you could be able to answer. Uh, I would like to have some details on face shield and mask usage. Why three or seven shifts is very uh, decontaminated procedure used. This may not be related to cardiology, but I think uh, the or the radiology. Right. Any. Yeah, I think, I mean, the reason really is that we have a shortage of PPE. And so it's, it's really to try to be able to reuse um, the PPE. And the, you know, the thinking is, is that if you wear a face shield, um, in front of the mask, then you avoid direct splatter and, and the filtering will still be probably effective um, for, for several shifts. Um, but you're right, ideally, if we get enough you know, PPE available, we could go back to switching it um, you know, between, between patients. Any questions from panel? Imagine, uh, imagine yes, panel. What's the Go question? Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I so, I mean, uh, thank you, Dr. Tuch. Uh, Tuch. I mean, I'm curious to know how much, uh, I mean, uh, deep learning or machine learning is used in your operation in terms of interpreting all the radiology data that is coming forth your way. Do you have, a, I mean, some kind of, a, I mean, workflow going towards that or you have uh, not implemented that yet? Yeah, no, absolutely. We, uh, we actually are trialing a certain manufacturers um, deep learning uh, algorithm that actually looks at <clears throat> all of our head CTs and cervical spine CTs for, fra for bleeds in the brain and uh, fractures in the spine. Um, I think, you know, what's on the market there are very targeted, you know, so it can't just sort of give an overall read on a CT of the, of the neck, cervical spine, for instance, but it can look for uh, uh, individual things. And we also have uh, some deep learning algorithms that are loaded on some of our CT scanners and our MRI scanners um, that are, uh, you know, able to reduce um, some of the noise in the image, so improves the signal to noise just by using, you know, this sort of uh, deep learning algorithm where uh, they were trained to sort of, you know, have the uh, noisy image that might be for a CAT scan, low dose, you know, you got somebody, a, ch a child, for instance, you do a low dose CT scan and you just have a deep learning algorithm clean the image up so it looks more uh, like a normal one, which, you know, that's the, pro that's the thing is you want them to look more normal to, to our regular dose because that's where we're most accurate at, at seeing findings. Okay. There's one more specific, question from the... Uh, sorry, specifically it's referring to the fact, can you discriminate between COVID-19 infected and non-infected patients when you do generic 
uh, scans for other, I mean, problems uh, associated with your hospital practice. Yeah, yeah, and and the uh, and Jeff Caney, who's one of my chest radiologists, is going to be talking about that. So they uh, they've developed an AI algorithm um, where they fed in a bunch of viral pneumonias that were from the flu and other things, and uh, COVID pneumonias, and you know, and 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 had it be able to learn how to what features did it look for to distinguish between the two of them. So I think it's going to make a chest CT much more accurate. Um, this would have been helpful back in March when we had a shortage of tests, but now that tests have gotten faster, I think it's. It's going to be uh, less likely because we're going to know patients just you know if they're COVID positive. But yeah, absolutely. The uh, there's a lot of work being done on that too. Okay, there's one question from the uh, Q&A box. Mark Oldham, uh, how many of the infrastructure changes made specifically for COVID are appropriate for long term? Yeah, I think we've talked a lot about that. I mean, we may be doing much more uh, reading from. Uh, you know, sort of remote sites as we've gotten better um, at it. And, uh, um, and, you know, I think it may help us even to prevent spreading, you know, other viral illnesses, even if we get COVID under control, you know, sort of such as the flu. Uh, so we're really discussing, you know, some of those things. Well, we appreciate for wonderful talk. Thank you so much. And we will be in touch. Thank you, sir. Bye. Uh, our next uh, plenary speaker, Dr. Radin, Jennifer Radin. Okay. Hi, okay. Yes, thank you for okay. having me. Great to see you, Jennifer. Jennifer is an epidemiologist with the Digital Medicine Division at Script Research Translational Institute, where she works on the improvement of disease prediction and prevention by incorporating digital devices, sensors, and platforms. And she is the PI on the DETECT and app-based research study that seeks to understand if the data from variable can provide early indication of the viral infection. Uh, she's received her PhD from UC San Diego. I think it's the, across the street, I guess, right, Jennifer? Yes. And also she has the Master of Public Health degree, a specialization in epidemiology of microbial disease from Yale University, and the, also the undergraduate from College of William and Mary. Jennifer, it's a great honor and pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. Let's see if I can get my slides pulled up. Can you see them okay? I we do. can see it. Yeah. Okay, yes. great. Thank you. Well, yeah, okay, thank I, you for having me today. I'm going to talk about our study, Harnessing Wearable Data to Improve Real-Time Detection of COVID-19. And so um, our group at Scripps Research, we aim to use wearable devices um, to better understand and characterize each individual. And so um, when we started this study, um, there's been a lot of work on better understanding kind of what is normal for each um, person out there. And so right now, what is normal is often based on population averages. So what is a normal resting heart rate is often defined as 60 to 100 beats per minute, which is a rather large range. Um, what is healthy? So um, a normal amount of sleep is often characterized as seven to nine hours um, per night and um, a healthy activity level. Um, people often cite 10,000 steps a day. Um, and um, as you all know, there's uh, a significant growth in the use of wearables um, across the country right now. In the United States, one in five Americans wears a fitness tracker or a smartwatch, and um, there's um, still a, a pretty drastic increase, um, predicted increase over time. And um, while there are some differences on who wears these devices um, based on um, age and race and income, um, as these devices become cheaper, they are going to be um, incorporated by more and more individuals. And this will, again, allow us to better understand what each individual's normal um, metrics are. And so our group um, had access to a data set of 200,000 Fitbit users who wore their device for um, about a two year period. And so we looked at um, sleep and we found that there was each person kind of had a typical amount of sleep that was, um, you know, pretty stable. It, it was 
varied a little bit on the weekends compared to weekdays, but um, each individual was kind of had this unique pattern. Um, however, between individuals, it varied quite a bit. As you can see, some people averaged only four hours of sleep, while some people averaged over nine hours of sleep. Um, they, we also found that um, average sleep did vary by body, ma body mass index as well. Um, and so we also looked at um, resting heart rate in this Fitbit data set. And um, like sleep, we found that everybody has this really unique resting heart rate that is unique to them. And um, for each person, we found that your resting heart rate varies very little from week to week, um, actually just about three beats per minute. But between individuals, resting heart rates can vary um, quite drastically from as low as 40 beats per minute to as high as over 100 beats per minute. And so um, what's normal for one person may actually be abnormal for another. And um, we're missing a huge amount of information when we um, apply kind of population averages as the norm rather than each person's individual average as can be measured and better characterized with these continuous variables. And so when we were looking at this resting heart rate data, we found that some individuals had these big um, jumps in the resting heart rate data um, over time. And we thought that this may indicate some sort of viral illness or something that was impacting their health and causing their resting heart rate to deviate from their norm. And what is interesting is, um, again, so these um, changes in resting heart rate, as you can see by this individual, it only went to about 80 beats per minute, which is still within the population norm of 60 to 100 beats per minute. But for this individual, it was outside of their normal range. So by um, better understanding what's normal, for each person, we can identify these subtle changes that may indicate something's going on with their health. And so we also use the same um, data set of 200,000 Fitbit users, and we um, looked at population trends. So we looked at state level data and we found that when you identify weeks where um, the proportion of individuals had an elevated resting heart rate and sleep that was above their individual norm, that this could significantly help us improve um, real-time detection of influenza-like illness um, at the state level. And so to just give a really quick background on um, viral illness surveillance in the United States, um, it is often um, delayed by one to three weeks. And um, the reason for this delay is that we still in the U.S. rely on very outdated ways of reporting um, data to central public health um, systems. So there are often even fax machines are still resorted to. Um, and um, because of that one to three week delay, public health officials um, can't act um, and respond to outbreaks very quickly. And this, again, gives them an opportunity to spread and grow larger before we even have identified that something's going on. And so um, other groups have tried to um, find ways to kind of get real-time um, data and information to track um, influenza-like illness and viral illness kind of at a population level. And so examples are Google flu trends where um, people have looked at the number of searches for um, cold-related um, terms in Google and also looking at um, Twitter, um, how many times people tweet a, um, terms that are related to being sick or having the flu. And so while these um, methods can potentially provide real-time information as to what's going on, um, unfortunately, they are also subject to um, the worried well or people um, that are reading about flu or outbreaks in the media. So um, Google flu trends was found to really overestimate um, outbreaks sometimes. And so finding an objective way to track this um, viral illness um, activity in real time is um, extremely useful. And so 
um, wearables really offers um, a unique data stream that again is objective. Um, we're tracking each individual over time. So we're comparing each person to themselves over time and we can identify these subtle um, changes that may indicate um, they are becoming ill. And then when we look at a population level, and find clusters or groups of people who are um, experiencing this elevated um, data compared to their norm over time, then that um, indicates that's kind of a outbreak or activity for viral illness might be changing. And so here this, um, we again showed that by adding this wearable data and combining it with um, CDC influenza-like illness data that was from three weeks prior, so that would be what you would know in real time, that we could significantly improve our ability to um, kind of predict what, what is happening in real time at the state level. So um, this really inspired us to launch um, the Detect study, um, which um, came out, um, it was inspired um, partially by COVID pandemic, and that inspired us that we really need to harness this wearable data to see if we can detect um, COVID-like illness, um, flu-like illness, and other viral illnesses in real time. And again, um, the goal of DETECT is to compare each individual to themselves over time and also to see if we can um, use wearable devices to um, supplement um, traditional outbreak response and tracking. And so um, DETECT is actually a remote um, digital research app where um, participants can download um, uh, My Data Helps, which is available in both um, Apple and Google. And through this research app, they um, run through an e-consent, um, which is approved by our, our IRB at Scripps. And they um, can also, um, they have to meet certain criteria to join, be over 18 years old and live in the United States right now. And um, then they can connect their, um, their fitness tracker. So we have a direct API with Fitbit, and we can also pull in data from HealthKit and Google Fit. So, um, we're device agnostic for this study, and we can pull in um, a, a very wide range of wearable devices. Um, and um, again, this is our goal is to be able to see if the um, changes in a user's wearable data over time um, are um, associated with um, different symptoms that they might um, report to us through this I'm feeling sick tab in the app and um, different diagnostic test results. Um, such as COVID, like or COVID um, test results and flu test results, so that we can um, identify, see if we can create a model to identify who has COVID versus who doesn't have COVID, or who has a viral illness based on both their wearable data and their self-reported symptom data. And so, another unique part of our research app um, is detect. We can um, connect to electronic health records. And um, it's kind of similar to the um, Apple health records. We can, if um, it's a, a, um, a list of different health systems that are compatible with this program. But um, this gives us another way to, to um, um, get a different data streams that we can incorporate in our model down the line. And so we have um, a bunch of big partners that have helped us um, get the word out about our research study. And um, currently we have um, 30, about 36,000 participants from across the country. Um, definitely a lot more participants in California um, since we're located um, in San Diego. Um, but we're really hoping to grow this number over time to um, 100,000 or more participants so we can potentially use this as a real-time viral illness tracking platform. Um, and this kind of shows some of the demographics of our participants. Um, so we have people from 18 all the way up to 89 years old. Um, definitely um, around um, 30 to 40 is our most um, um, common age group and slightly more women in our study. And so another um, idea of using wearable data is um, for screening. So Currently in the United States, um, temperature and symptom surveys are 
um, often used to identify um, which individuals should go to work um, for school, screening children, whether they um, are acceptable to attend school. However, um, temperature screening is actually um, a very poor way to identify who may be sick with COVID. So um, there's been many studies that have shown even among individuals who present to a hospital, only about 30 to 40 percent actually have a fever. And so um, fever screening is really going to miss many individuals who um, may be sick. Um, and um, there's been other studies that have shown that um, resting heart rate um, tends to increase um, even a couple days prior to fever onset. So as we showed in our um, retrospective influenza-like illness study, resting heart rate and these other um, metrics that can be collected from wearable devices um, can potentially be used as another um, way to screen people and identify if they're coming down with some sort of viral illness. And so um, we recently published a study in Nature Medicine um, which showed that if you combine a user's wearable data with um, self-reported symptom data, you could significantly um, improve um, your ability to identify who has COVID versus who does not have COVID. And so these are kind of the area under the curves for different models. And what we found is kind of this, if you just look at sensor data, we got an area under the curve of 0.7, um, similar for just looking at symptoms. So the main symptom that is predictive of COVID versus no COVID is loss of sense and smell. But then if you combine both the self-reported symptoms plus the sensor data, um, we got a significantly higher area under the curve um, of 0.8. And so this is really exciting because um, this can be a measure or a way to um, supplement traditional screening methods of temperature and self-reporting symptoms and be able to identify more people who um, may be coming down with a viral illness such as COVID. And these methods could then be paired with um, self-isolation and getting tested um, um, before people go about their daily lives and spread um, infection to others. And so we have many um, other goals for our DETECT study. Um, we think this data is um, really valuable and some of the other um, research projects which we're hoping to do down the line are also see if we can identify both pre-symptomatic and um, asymptomatic detection um, of COVID like or of COVID illness using wearable devices. And that would be um, really um, useful since again um, these cases are very hard to identify using traditional means and um, currently testing, routine testing of asymptomatic individuals um, is very hard to do. We still don't have those testing supplies. Another goal, we um, want to look to see if wearable devices can also help identify kind of trajectory of your viral illness, whether you're going to be um, going about your daily life, no, not many symptoms, or whether you're going to get hospitalized. So I think there's a great value of kind of tracking people over time who get sick to kind of see um, where, if they're getting worse or if they're getting better. And then finally, um, as I said earlier, our, one of our goals is kind of to create this digital disease surveillance platform. So much like um, a weather forecasting uh, across the United States, we think this wearables, um, which are worn by one in five Americans, can really give us um, real-time data um, and also more um, geographic specific data as to viral activity levels across the country. And so we hope this will enable public health responders to act much faster than they currently have with um, kind of the delayed um, surveillance data that is currently available. And um, I'll just quickly mention that these sensors are continually evolving and and new metrics are added all the time. And so we also want to incorporate new sensors and see how all these other metrics, such as cough analysis and heart rate variability and um, EKG and all these different variables can further help improve our predictive models. And I'll just lastly say that, um, you know, this effort was really quite a team effort. Um, as um, one of my colleagues wrote up in the World Economic Forum, um, our group has really pivoted um, to kind of respond to this pandemic and hopefully 
um, find new ways to help um, get data that can help us act quickly and effectively. So um, thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Dr. Radin, fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Let me check the... Uh, Radin, you know? while you're checking, may I pose a question to Dr. Of Radin? Of course, of course. Please go ahead, Shankar. Dr. Radin, thank you so much uh, for really a great talk. Uh, and I'm, uh, I, would you comment on uh, uh, statistical models, including all the variables you talked about uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, their ability to predict as well as uh, the sensitivity with reference to different things so that the one main question I have regarding that is, you know, all of us have homeostatic values for most of these parameters or variables you're looking at. Deviation from our own specific values would be the one that you'd really be looking at. So do you have any precision linear or nonlinear statistical model that would help in terms of deciphering this? Yeah, so our um, initial study, which I showed here, is really based on, um, it's very preliminary. So we had 54 COVID positive um, participants. Um, so that's a small number and we weren't able to fully fit our model for this study. Um, but we um, kind of manually um, fit our model. So we identified individuals who had um, elevated um, sleep, um, elevated resting heart rate and less um, activity, as well as um, a model that had been previously pu published in Nature Medicine that used um, smartphones to um, look at just symptoms as predictive of COVID positive versus COVID negative patients. And so we used um, the variables that they had pr fit previously in their model combined with our wearable um, data um, to improve um, the ability to predict COVID positive versus COVID negative patients here. So yes, there's much more that we hope to do to really fit our models when we um, are able to um, have more COVID positive cases um, in our study, hopefully in the near future. Jennifer, I have one question. And do you have any international collaboration? Do you have any yeah. data from Europe, Asia, also South Central America and Canada also? Yeah, so we are launching um, DETECT in Australia and Guam um, very soon. And um, there's a similar study that is done in Germany that has um, over 500,000 um, participants who have shared their wearable data. Um, and they are using this um, data to successfully track fever um, illness in their country. So, um, and then there's also a study that was published um, that used um, wearable data in China and um, similar methods to our influenza-like illness prediction. They um, found that the data kind of tracked um, influenza-like illness um, rates in their country in different regions. Um, so there's um, a bunch of similar studies going on around the world um, and it's uh, really exciting to, um, to learn from all of um, the stuff that they're doing as well. Also, the uh, IEEE Society, we are uh, building a partnership with Dataport IEEE as an EMBS. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, soon you will be receiving emails, detailed emails on this. We are requesting the colleagues from different parts of the world to share their data images through the data ports. And also, they could have access to data ports to use machine learning and the artificial intelligence, deep learning techniques to analyze data. And they also, as a new president-elect, I highly encourage them to publish in our fantastic journals. We have an open access journal led by the Paolo Bonato. He's a program co-chair of the forum. And also we have BHI, Journal of Biomedical Informatics, and we have other journals. So it's, the, it's going to be very collaborative, very interactive, and also we will have more data from different parts of the world. And I see the one Great. talk and the, uh, from Murat Demirer. Did you look at the Hearst exponent for resting heart uh, rate variability? So unfortunately, we, um, we did not have resting heart rate variability for our retrospective Fitbit data set that we looked at. Um, 
And for our current one, um, we don't have much resting heart rate variability data, so we have not looked at it yet. But um, as we gather more data and different sensors, that's definitely something we hope to look at in the future. Okay. Well, I appreciate your inspiring talk. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Great. <laughs> and we will be in touch. And uh, before I conclude the first symposium, and I would like to uh, the acknowledge the FU colleagues. I know this is not the last day, but we have four different symposiums throughout the day, and some of you may not be joining us. We have uh, five people. They really helped us with the logistic, publicity, web pages, Mark Markowitz, and Nate Kunun, and the Dr. Charlotte Spates, Dr. Ting Chang, and Nick Plasco. And the, uh, also, uh, I would like to uh, introduce the tomorrow the symposium. Uh, second symposium will be Grand Challenge in COVID-19 uh, screening. Will be led by Dr. Colleen Brennan, who is also the another the uh, program uh, chair for the forum. And so the we conclude today on behalf of uh, Shankar Subramanian, Paolo Bonato, and Colleen Brennan. I appreciate your time, your energy. I would like to also the last confession uh, without the contribution of our program chairs and also the uh, form co-chair and the, these five people, this symposium will not be a success. I think they deserve more credit than I do. Thank you so much and look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 10 a.m. and the, I look forward to another exciting the symposium. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you.